Let me adjust my ascot real quick. I gotta gotta look perfect. And uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting nice and uh, primped and and proper here because during the course of the interview, we've uh, gotten word that some of the viewers were overheating with with the vapors, and so we had to change outfits to throw them off. And so that's why uh, that's why sure we look that, different than the last uh, segment we were talking in. Are you sure that's not a new recreational chemical? The vapors, you know. Like... Welcome, my dear, dear friends. It's marvelous to see you. I'm Stephen Clements, a writer, a gamer, and an appreciator of big brain activities in general. On this channel, I perform dramatic readings of my stories. I provide role-playing game reviews, and I get to interview interesting people. On this episode, we get to have our first interview with the gaming legend that you never knew about until now, Mr. Christopher Clark. A longtime friend and protege of the creator of Dungeons and Dragons, the late great Mr. Gary Gygax, Mr. Clark is the head honcho at Inner City Games Designs and the writer and publisher of some of the longest lived role playing games in existence. He too is a dear, dear friend, and I've always enjoyed our conversations and time spent around the gaming table together. If you like to be entertained and learn a thing or two, some of the topics covered in this conversation include role-playing games, life on the convention circuit, his work with some of the finest game designers to have ever lived, and his top movie picks. I know you're going to find this entertaining, and I do hope you enjoy the show. Well, my dear, dear friends, let's welcome to the show a game designer, friend of mine, goes by the name of Christopher Clark, and he is a man who has been involved with the RPG industry almost as long as it's been around, has worked with nearly everybody in it at some point, put his own excellent games out there, a staple of the best conventions that exist, you're always going to find him there. And a man with 112 author credits to his name, but he's worked on even more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, probably mostly gentlemen, but in case there's a lady out there, I want to make sure that <laughs> you are recognized. We have so much to talk about with this guy. It might take several episodes. And once you get to hearing him and his stories, you're going to see what I'm talking about. So without further ado, my dear, dear friends, I give you Christopher Clark. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, after an introduction of that nature, I cannot fail to disappoint, I'm sure. <laughs> well, see, I, 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 I did not invent sliced bread. I'm going to start by saying that. Uh, contrary to what St Stephen just told you, I did not invite, didn't invite, invent the internal combustion engine, and I did not invent RPGs. But I did glom onto them at a young age because uh, they were just kind of cool, you know. Well, yeah, that's why there's, there's something in a role-playing game that when you take your first look at it or you first hear about it, something something zaps you in the brain and you're like, yeah, I want more of that. And so we're going to get into details on how that happened to you. Um, but as the observant watcher or listener may already note, uh, we're not five minutes into the interview and he's already cracking jokes. Um, I haven't played with Chris several times and talked to him several times. If you're in a game with him, you're going to have a good time. He's going to do a good job, but pay attention to the nonstop one-liners and jokes that he's going to toss at you because there's some gold in there. Um, so I, I don't want anybody. Well, it's well. mostly to distract you from the fact that the air pressure is decreasing in the cabin and you're still not certain why. And your spacesuit oxygen is down to 12 minutes. You know, <laughs> the, the one liners there keep your mind off of those things oh. just long enough that we'll be asking you to drop a new character. See, I thought it was to uh, flood the field with uh, things to make you paranoid because you're getting stimulus from every single angle. And so you don't know, oh no, I got, I got a panic. Oh no. Dirty GM trick number one. And this one's a freebie for everybody, okay? If you're the, the game master, we'll say dungeon master if you're playing fantasy, but if you're not, if you're the game master, you just grab a whole big handful of dice, roll them, and then pretend to start counting numbers. Okay? There's nothing attached to that. Just do that and watch everybody at the table go, what? What? You know, yeah. Yeah. Nothing. I just yeah. wanted to see which dice came up uh, 11, you know. Yeah, I was just curious. I've got dice, too. I like rolling them. Did that, that derail the game? I'm sorry. I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 
to go on to the point that you mentioned about uh, when you got started in RPGs, yeah, how did you get started with gaming? Well, uh, you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna relate that to why do people like RPGs? What is it about the RPG that makes it unique? And I started actually gaming with Avalon Hill Games, Luftwaffe, and because they were really kind of neat. I was something of a history buff, and I loved the adult nature of uh, and tactics of those types of games. Well, the problem is when you play those is there are winners and losers. When you're playing an RPG, everybody can win. This is the cool thing about RPGs. Any good game is, is about the acquisition of power. You're not going to play it and enjoy it unless you're acquiring power during the game, okay? Mm. But in an RPG, everyone involved can acquire power. Not only that, they can acquire power in a direction that suits their fantasy image of who they are. So, for instance, if you're the paladin, you are the voice of the righteous, and that is the power that you gain if you're properly playing your paladin. And if you're the barbarian, you're just this big, ugly brute that breaks things and kills things. And so you, your power extends in that direction. If you're the wizard, you're trying to master the arcane power of the universe. And so your power grows in that direction. But that's what makes the RPG unique, is it's not just everybody wins. It's a you direct the power in the game that you gain under character control rather than under Milton Bradley control, game master control, or anything else that might be outside the game, so to speak. Or, or as we used to say, oom, out of, out of character, you know, or ook. Yeah, somebody... Ook. Ook. That, that, was, that was the early days, is, is the players was, ook, yes, what? Is there a rule? You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, what you, uh, the way you put it makes a whole, whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, when I was a younger man, I was more drawn to the uh, uh, physically powerful characters, like, uh, you know, give me an orc uh, with a big old axe or something like that. And uh, the older I get, the more interested I am. It's like from like the vampire game, uh, like a, a Toreador. Um, a lot of uh -huh. younger guys would look at a Toreador and and think of them as a feat snobs. But if you're if you're really into the game, if you're really into the kind of spaces that vampire lets you explore, the rarefied tastes and mm -hmm. the wickedness that can go with it in the clan, um, it's it, it gets to be more of like a mind it's play. Yeah, it's a, a finesse character. Finesse, yeah, finesse. Yeah, you know, like what can I do it. without overwhelming brute strength? Well, true. You, you have one direction, you know, and then I will raise a castle. You, you don't want a castle. Raise a cave. Fill it, fill it with other brutes. Raise a cave. You don't want a castle. It's too much. Yeah, money. yeah. Because you know, yeah. once you build a them. castle, it's all kinds of money to, well, it's all kinds of money to make one. You need all kinds of craftsmen. You need uh, tradesmen, yeah. you need labor, and then it's upkeep, and it's nothing but maintenance costs. Barbarian and logistics do never occur in the same sentence. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a Do you have a favorite character or a favorite character? Uh, I class generally, or type? I, I, when it comes to fantasy, I generally play wizards. I do, um, with with some slight variations. If I play a legendary adventure, I like to play the Earth wizards, which are called uh, geomancers. Uh, if I play straight up first edition, and I'm kind of a straight up first edition guy, I admit that. Okay, just play a magic user, a wizard. But mm -hmm. you always have to look for the loopholes in 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 uh, wizardry, and in almost any RPG, magic is where the loopholes occur. Somebody creates an item that only the magic users can can use. But you know, when you use this, by the way, the entire universe can explode. Is, is invariably something that shows up in every system once or twice. And so, yeah, that's I kind of like to leverage games that way. I do. Well, and you talk about loopholes and magic items, the staff of the of the magi from yeah. uh you know first second edition. Yes, you can snap the thing in a desperation move and it does a bunch of damage. And by the normal rules of the game, you're at ground zero, it should take you out. But there's a tiny percentage chance. That it might shoot you into some other plane of existence instead of annihilating yep. you. Yes. Um, and so there you go. Your loopholes and magic. It, you have the rules, but these guys know how to move around it. That's in the days before my wife was my wife, she would game with us. She would play first edition DD. And I tried to convince her to play a cleric. She wanted to play a druid. I don't know, honey. Play a cleric. Why? 
Well, the cleric in first edition gets a spell called Command. And I said, of all of the spells that Gary wrote, this one is way OP. And although we didn't say OP back then, but we do now. Overpowered. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she's like, why? And I said, well, I'll play the cleric for you um, for your next encounter, and, and you'll see why it's OP. Well, the next encounter happened to be uh, a wilderness encounter where they were being dive-bombed by a green dragon. And the green dragon comes thundering in and is ready to breathe on the party, and I went, sleep. And it fell asleep and crashed into the earth at 85 miles an hour. Nice. Yeah, and I said, that spell is over. That's a first-level clerical spell. Right? <laughs> you can trade a cure light wounds for that one, you know. Oh, my, oh yeah, I'll play the cleric. That was it. She was so. <laughs> when the dragon hit the ground, did he wake up? Uh, no, no. He took 16 die 6 falling damage from that, which was enough to do him in. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't bring his horde with him, but, you know, eh, at least we got the eeps, as we used to say. That that works. That works. You, you, you're second edition, right? That's what I grew up on. Uh, so you guys said edition. XP, right? You guys always said XP. We do. See, we, we used do. to say Eeps. We, you know, give us Eeps. So Eeps versus XP. All That's right. right. So we're already yeah. creating different clans based on different. There you go. <laughs> now I love first edition AD and D, uh, second edition AD and D, and really the even like the the later basic stuff. It all you can come with any I, bit of it. I enjoy playing all of it. I don't enjoy GMing three and beyond because you really have to know the stuff i know that sounds funny right yeah chris is a vast font of useless knowledge but um i'm not i don't have the system mastery of three four or five to feel comfortable as a game master i like playing them um the, the, the three four and five are all geared towards more character controlled outcomes less gm controlled outcomes and yeah. i know that's why players like them in many instances sure. than, the, than the early ones but if I'm going to spend all this time writing a story, darn it, you're playing it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and you make a good point. Um, I was just listening to uh, some of the Goodman Games designers. They have uh, a, uh, a show called Talking TSR. And in the episode I'm listening to, they're talking about um, Palace of the Silver Princess. And one of the things that uh, they remark on, and it's not at all a kept secret, is that those earlier editions did more to support the dungeon master and to teach people how to do it. Yep. And then the options available to the players were, were basically manageable by the DM. Right. Uh, but three and beyond, the options for the players exploded and yes. the support for the DM, even learning the craft, let alone knowing how to manage all this stuff, just went through the floor. And that's why you have a dearth of DMs and a bunch of players were not willing to step up to the plate because it's way more intimidating. Whereas I got started DMing with the uh, basic Dungeons and Dragons uh, black box set and Zanzer's Dungeon. And it had, I think, the adventure itself, when you're running it for other people, it was as simple as could be. But it also had a choose-your-own-adventure style that you run yourself through first so right. you learn how it's supposed to go. And I think Mincer did that in his yep. edition. Um, you know, help up, help DMs, help you players. Uh, you know, <laughs> to, uh, come back to read that old stuff. Yeah, you, you had to know if you were the GM for third edition. You have to know all of the feats. You have to know all of the abilities. Yeah. You know, otherwise, when somebody uses them, you scratch your head and you're an ineffective GM. Funny thing is, there is a name for third edition where I wrote the story. So darn it, you're going to follow it. Do you know what the name is? It's What's called that? Pathfinder. And Pathfinder got really popular because GMs like it. And the players still get all of their feats and abilities. And so it's a nice mix. Um, <laughs> although I, I found I can't write for Pathfinder. So it's, Oh, no. Oh, yeah. no. I guess you'll just have to keep supporting the, what, 50 games you got? <laughs> um, when would you even have time to write for anybody else? I've seen your product list, which we're going to get into, into some of those titles. Uh, later on, but while we're on this topic of uh, additions and you know, additional sure. wars, uh, I take it you got started on the 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 uh, the Dungeons and Dragons pamphlets, like the chainmail supplements. Uh, where did you get started? Um, I, my my first book was actually the Blue Holmes book ah. uh, that we got via mail order, um, and then I afterwards bought the three book box set at the Dungeon Hobby Shop in Lake Geneva, and you're going to die for ten bucks because they were on sale. Um, I, I unfortunately lost that box set in a flood in my basement in Illinois in 1998. 
damn you, Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, no damn problem. you. Um, and, and it was, I, it. I, I had it, I had the box on the floor. So, okay, it's my fault. But thankfully, I had removed the Swords and Spells booklet from it, and I left that on my bar downstairs. So the Swords and Spells book I still have. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that survived. So when that when you got that material, was this, uh, how old were you when that happened? 17, 16. Okay, all right. Yeah. Did you jump into running it for your friends? Did one of your friends run it for one, you? One of my friends, Charlie Lewis, was our GM until I was late 17, um, and it, it's funny you should bring it up that way because this this deals with something that will potentially wind up on Kickstarter in about a year. Oh, yeah. But that was when I first wrote the first couple of encounters for uh, a long stringing adventure that at that point was just termed Castle Wolf Moon. Um, since that time, it has been split off because, of course, it kept growing during my college years, during my high school years, because everybody loved Castle Wolf Moon. Um, well, and it's the classic Dave Arneson, Blackmore, let's write a huge dungeon thing, right? You know. All right, uh, all right. But we split off, yeah, we split off the first uh, portion of the adventure is now for sale called A Challenge of Arms. The second portion of the adventure, which gets in a little deeper, is called Ritual of the Golden Eyes. The castle is still to be done, and actually it's entirely written up because, and I'm going to digress even further, I was having the conversation with Gary, much like you and I are having, mm -hmm. and he mentioned, well, why haven't I seen this Castle Wolf Moon that you worked on? So I sent him the files. I sent him 76 pages of Castle Wolf Moon. It came back as 374 pages. <laughs> Attention to detail, guy gags. Wait, wait, a week later. He turned yeah, out that, that much was material. Gary, that was what it was like to work with Gary Guy. Anyway, and I got him on the phone. I was like, oh. I'm not ready to publish this. I got to give you something for your work here. What do you need for work for hire? So I wrote him a work for hire contract for $400. And that was it. And of course, Gary's not here anymore. And now I have this wonderful five layer dungeon with 10 extra planar adventures. And I've got all the rights to it. And it's Gary Gygax's perhaps final unpublished work. Ooh. So now you understand the whole Kickstarter sometime next year, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I think yeah. if uh, anything's going to hook people watching this to look forward to that, yeah, that's going to be it because you, you're you going to get my money out of that <laughs> for well, sure. I don't want your money. I want you to play and enjoy. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's, it costs I, I, money I, I, to make these things. And does. you paid four hundred dollars. What uh, ten years? What fourteen? Nineteen ninety-eight. Oh, four hundred dollars. So if you and I first, go, first started working together on the Hexforge stuff, yeah, that's awesome. That's and, awesome. Uh, well, Gary and I—it's weird. Gary and I used to refer to each other as brothers by another mother. Now, not so much because we shared game design insight. We didn't. We diametrically opposed each other in a lot of things to do with gaming. But we were both, and I'm going to use the term gingerly, um, conservatives. We both were very happily married. We both had kids named Alex. Just by coincidence, um, we shared a lot of common viewpoints, and we weren't mentor and mentee. We were colleagues. We would sit on his porch, uh, sipping scotch and ogling women. I mean, yes, you know, ooh, and after my own like heart, it. yeah. Man, so, but something like this was more him saying, "Come on, we're buds. I'll do this for you," than anything else. And uh, which, <laughs> you know, yes. That that that's so cool. Um, now I've I've got more questions about Gary specifically. Um, but my and all this stuff intertwines. It's 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 a it's a huge morass. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, but we're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. <laughs> um, who all else have you worked with? I mean, it seems like you've crossed. It's almost everybody. Yeah, it's almost easier to say who I haven't. Oh, okay. Okay. Now I've been friends with, but I've never had the opportunity. A couple of people I'd really like to work with. Um, uh. Dave Cook, Dave alias Zeb Cook. Yeah. Man's an incredible writer. Brilliant. Uh, I don't I don't think I could do him justice working with him, to be honest with you. I don't really think he ever needs me to work with him. Ed Greenwood. Ah. Incredible, incredible writer. Uh, incredible storyteller. And I'm sorry, I, I differentiate between the two. There are a number of people who are extremely good writers, 
not great storytellers. Mm -hmm. There are people who are great storytellers and not particularly great writers. This is an important distinction. And some people can write setting material all day, but when you have to make it actionable, like in an adventure, falls apart. Well, and vice versa. Even in Gary, a lot of his stuff is, you mentioned attention to detail. A lot of it was rather encyclopedic. In other words, it lacked fire, I guess. Um, when he first sent me the manuscript for his source book for The Legendary Earth, it was 96 pages. And I was like, why don't we just, you know, order the Britannica set? Because I read through it and I was like, well, it's all here, but it's kind of dull. Well, what would you do? So we added rumors and legends and myths. And, you know, the queen of so-and-so has her eye on the king of such and such, and their spouses don't know about it. And you know, we added all of this little extra Flavor. to it. And people loved it. People absolutely loved it. We unfortunately only got through the third book on that series out of five um, for reasons I really don't want to go into, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. So Gary Gygax spent plenty of time around him, and I want to get more in depth on that for our, our viewers, our listeners uh, sure. very soon. But you, you scrolled away from that first question about uh, who all of you worked with. What are some of the big names from, say, the, the classic era of D&D that you worked with? When I started working with Gary, and I, towards the end of our relationship, and I, it didn't really end as a relationship, it ended as a company. Um, he said, well, why don't you call Frank Menser? Because he can help you out, and he knows how to do layout and stuff, too. So I did call Frank Menser. Um, That's a good one. Frank, Frank kind of knew me. Um, because we'd run into, into each other at cons over the previous 30 years. But it was funny because Frank said, no, I don't have time. I'm running a bakery, which he was at the time. Yeah, I know. Was he any good at it? Yeah, actually, their their baked goods were quite good. In fact, he used to bring uh, Kringle to, um, yeah, Gary Con before it was Gary Con. Winter Dark is what it was called. When it was hosted by the Troll Lords at the Cove, rather than the giant uh, hotel it's at now. Now the Cove, that's the uh, the Chicago version of the Playboy Mansion. Is that right? Is that their, their now, the, the Cove is the one, if you, if you go <laughs> through the intersection and down the hill, it's right off the corner. Oh, a whole different thing. Okay. In Lake Geneva, yes. Yeah. Now did Frank spoke, focus on breads, uh, savories, Pastries. or sweets? Pastries, definitely. Mm. Pastries. He invested heavily, I invested heavily in his pastries. I, I mm. could stand up and show you, but it's not pretty. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and the funny thing was he was good friends with Tim Cask still. They had remained close buddies the whole time. Uh, and I had always been friends with Jim Ward, but kind of, uh, every time I see him in a con, I'll sit down and yak with him for a while basis. Right. Well, that later became, heck, uh, well, we're still on, on who else did you work with, but that later became a situation where Frank, because Jim wound up having a number of, um, Hospital related bills. Okay. About the time Eldridge Enterprises came into being, Jim did not as yet know that he was diabetic. Mm, that's the best surprise. He knew he was eating without gaining weight. He knew he was always tired. He knew he had strange bumps appearing on his skin one, from time to time. So he finally got diagnosed up by Mayo in Minneapolis uh, with diabetes. They're like, here's your whole problem. Start taking insulin and watch your diet. Okay. Not that he heeded their advice terribly well, but that's that's what they told him. Hard to do. Frank, because Jim had, I want to say, 80, 90, $100,000 worth of medical bills. And unbeknownst to most people, even the old grognards never got paid hugely. None of these guys are fabulously wealthy. Okay. And so he was in a tight spot. And Frank said, let's get Jim out of a tight spot. We're going to form a company. He had uh, several investors that were interested in backing Let's Put the Band Together. Um, I will not mention them because I think they deserve anonymity, but be that as it may. Um, they weren't terribly excited. But Gary had evidently talked with many of these guys earlier, which was one of the reasons they wanted to be involved, and had name-dropped me a lot. So um, Frank went through a list of several people with these guys with, you know, I could bring these guys into the company. When they mentioned me, they all went, oh, yeah, if Chris was part of the company, we'd back it. Slam and, dunk. Well, and Frank told me that point blank, and I was like, okay, so what, now I'm supposed to say no? I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> you know. 
Well, and so then we formed Eldritch and I got to know Tim a whole bunch better and I got to know Jim a whole Jim and I are still we talk three times a week. So yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, he's a good guy. And Jim, by the way, Jim is one of the best storytellers I have ever met. He's not the greatest writer. He writes okay, but he's a fantastic storyteller. Frank is a fantastic writer. He's a decent storyteller. And Tim is is about you know, 80% on both as far as the top of the ranch being way up here. Um, he, he, he does, he does both fairly well, but none of them did it enough. And that's what I told these guys was, you know, we got to start producing stuff because yeah. you have investors and, you know, it's the private spec sector. They expect results, you know? So, um, you know, together we did 16 adventures Wow. Because the business plan I laid out for them was um, each of us does four adventures and then in your own little, you know, string them together. And then we do a source book that covers the world that those adventures occurred in. Well, the source book is what makes money, Chris. I said, I, I'm aware. But if you just start out with a source book, nobody buys it. If you get them hooked by running your adventures, then a bunch of people buy it. That is a good marketing technique because... Who needs another rule system or a new setting? When exactly. I've got an umpteen on my shelves right now, and I weep softly every night knowing I will never get to run most of them. Right. Yeah. And, well, especially if you have to come up with your own adventures because they yeah. never never survived beyond the source book stage. Right. Wizards of the Coast uh, are the ones who taught Frank this philosophy, and it's true that there's more money in the source books. Well, what did they do at Wizards of the Coast? They created the SRD and said, hey, all of you guys that can afford to do it, write the adventures. We're going to do the source books, make the big money. And that that's why that fell out that way. But you can't just be the new kid on the block and not have a reason for people to be playing your stuff. And so starting with that reason means starting with an adventure that drags them. And, and that's I it. Yeah. I get them. Now, I just want to interject real quick. You mentioned uh, several names and, um, tracking that the ones that, that you just mentioned, uh, they're all still alive. And for yes. folks who haven't been to cons, if go, go to cons because these, these classic designers, these luminaries of the industry, the folks who made the foundations on which all of us play, all of us dream this and that they're, they're getting older, but you can still meet them. You can talk to them. You can hang out with them. You can game with them. And do not let this opportunity go past. Do not do that. Well, and here's a plug for Gary Khan. Uh, not that I don't love NTRPG Khan, because I do. Okay. Um, That's North Texas Role Playing Game Convention, where um, I've gone twice, and I just bought my ticket for the third, and uh, get to see this guy at least once a year. Oh, and, yeah, we'll be coming back with it with bells on, believe me. But uh, Jim can no longer go to those. The only convention Jim is allowed to travel to for his health is Gary Khan because it's local. Yeah, so if you want to oh. meet Jim Ward, a legendary game, yeah. get your butt up to Wisconsin. And and you know what? Go next year because yeah. Jim is 71 and he is fighting the fight of his life right now. Get it in. Get it in. Um, so, um, and Frank, speaking of and Frank and Tim don't, well, sorry. Frank and Tim don't do many cons anymore. So yeah. I'm sure they do one or two during the year that I'm unaware of. But they never say anything about it. And I know for the most part that they aren't doing cons. So. It seemed like pre-COVID, Tim Cask was making as many rounds as people would pay him to make. Because um, I saw him at Gary Con. I saw him at uh, the first iteration of AppleCon. I think might be the only iteration of AppleCon in Cornish, Maine that Lloyd Metcalf put on. But right. if you, if I, you I know, I know Lloyd too, by the way. Up. I know Lloyd too, by the way. And how well do I know Lloyd? Um, his motorcycle spent the winter in my garage. <laughs> but Lloyd and I are pretty good friends. I've actually written two modules with Lloyd as well. So uh, Lloyd Metcalf, all right. Yes. Yeah. Those damn goblins is one that I did with Lloyd. So. I have that one. You do? I have that one. I didn't check the credits page though. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's one of mine. So yeah. So that's gonna be the best one, no doubt. <laughs> um but uh, speaking good, yeah. of designers and Gary Khan, it was uh the year of COVID when Gary Khan went to virtual. And I think I played in my first inner city game with you that there was another designer that uh, I don't think gets quite the credit that he deserves for the role-playing part of the role-playing game genre, Harold Johnson. Yes. Uh, did you ever work with Harold? Um, not on a project per se, 
but I used to work with Harold fairly closely uh, when Gen Con was in Milwaukee. Okay. So, and he, we, he would help us organize tournaments and do all sorts of things. We used to run Inner City as a tournament, believe it or not. So, um, really? Yes. You know, get oh. your gang of six guys, and whoever has the most loot after three sessions goes into the <laughs> final round against the other team that had the most loot uh, in the shootout in Lakeside Park. And it was just a huge character on character brawl <laughs> fest for the end. Yeah. And if you haven't but, heard of Inner City RPG yet, uh, we're, we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit more about it here in a few minutes. It's, it's when, a, and well, Harold is the one that put all those together. He, he okay. Not, would never have happened without Harold. Give the man some props. Yeah. So, yeah. Props, props to Harold Johnson. Props to the guy. Um, um, if you ever want to, if you ever wonder why Dragonlance was written the way it was with the kind of dramatic, uh, romantic, um, kind of soap opera feel, probably a lot of that had to do with Harold Johnson because he came from a theater background, I believe. Yes. And he wanted to no. inject role playing into role playing games. Still does theater. And that's uh, wonderful. Uh, what's his most famous module? Can you remember? The Shrine of the Lost. Ah, uh, he has done Return to the Tomoakin with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Trying to think of the name of the company and I cannot bring it to mind, but it has been released. I think so I it, saw that on sale. At a yep, Gary Harold, Harold Johnson fans, it's out there, gang, and it looked pretty good. It looked good. pretty good. Glad he's still at it. Glad he's still kicking. Glad he's still uh, putting out material. And uh, but for aspiring designers or writers out there, um, you you don't get anywhere by never putting any points on the board. You got to write. You got to put your butt in the seat. And you got to put words on the page what? and put it in front of other people. I even told Gary, and I, I, I will say this loud and proud. I told Gary. The best thing you've ever done should be the next thing you do, period. The thing you're aiming at. If, if you think, you know, I've learned it all and I have no more, you know, no more uh, castles to conquer, you're wrong. You can always do a little bit better next time than you did last time. You know, yeah. I hear you. Speaking of Gary, so let's let's talk just about Gary right now. All right. So when did you first meet Gary Gygax? <laughs> I was 15. Um. Yeah, because I couldn't drive yet. I it, when you go back that many years, okay. And no, I'm sorry, gang. For me, that's like 50 years ago. So, um, but when I was 15, we went to something in Lake Geneva called Mini Gen Con Two, and it was six dollars to get a badge to get in. It Man, was that's a, like a thousand dollars back then, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It is a reasonable amount of money. Um, actually, the wait one second. Yeah. I have a bunch of these. Oh, I paid six dollars for this player's handbook from the Dungeon Hobby Shop. So yeah, the and, original. Yeah, wow. well, I have. I, I honestly, I have five of them on the shelf. So my, for those my listening along, them and I would just go buy another. For those so listening stuff. along, because you can't stand the raw sex appeal of looking at both of us at the same time, maybe <laughs> in isolation you can handle it, but both at the same time, it's a lot to ask. He just pulled down a uh, tattered but still intact copy. Of the AD and D first edition player's handbook yes. that he picked up and back six in the bucks. Day. So, how much was six bucks worth back then? A hardcover book. So, probably <laughs> fifty anyway. Thirty-five to fifty these days, anyway, right? That's awesome. Um, I got into a game because I love playing miniature games. At that point, we hadn't really gotten into D and D yet at all. Okay. Uh, I, but I love playing miniature games, and so uh, I was given a wizard with some body, some uh, heavy infantry bodyguards. And I was and was told by the game master who I didn't really know yet uh, that that this was this was my group to run that I had a wand of frost with three charges in it and the trolls were about to invade our camp so sure enough the trolls come barreling in and they kill off the archers and I'm retreating up to the top of a hill because I know you know high ground you know if you play miniatures you got to get the high ground I'm retreating up this hill and one by one my bodyguards get dropped by trolls uh -huh. and we're about. We're about an hour and a half into the game, and the game master leans over to me, and and he he says, "Chris," and I and I looked at his badge because I was like, "Oh, Gary, hey, this is your game." He said, "Yes, it is." He said, I, do, "Do you mind if I give you a little advice?" And I said, "No, of course, my goodness, it's your game." He said, "Well, don't let that don't let that bother you." Um, he said, "But you have three charges on your frost one. Yes, yes, I do. I'm saving them, saving them for just the right moment." He said, do you, do you know what they call a wizard who dies with all of his spells intact? I said, no. He said, that, that person's a moron, okay? 
<laughs> the next troll that charges you, I want you to stick your wand in its belly button and pull the trigger. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. That's and that's how, I got, well, that's how I got to know Gary after, and we, we did win, by the way, because of the frost wand, he had enough charge. Um, after the event, he invited me to go sit and have lunch with him. And of course, all my friends were like, can we come to, yeah, of course. And we all sat and had lunch with Gary. He said, I did. I hope I wasn't too hard on you. And I was like, no, it was good advice. We won. I said, that's what's important, right? He said, well, this new fantasy miniature supplement that we're doing, I, you know, I think you're going to really like, uh, we've expanded it into a role-playing game. And I want to encourage you to try our, our new role-playing game too. And we sat and talked for 20 minutes while everyone else actually ate something. <laughs> and it, it just it's, it's Gary was maybe 45, 50 back then. He he still had most of his hair for God's sake. Anyway, um Ooh. didn't have that bald spot. But uh, um, I notice that we're both representing pretty well. Thank God. <laughs> I, low stress life. I make games for a living. I, you know. <laughs> um but, but it was funny. And so I stayed in touch with him. Every other con I went to, I I would stop and see Gary and say hi and we got to be friends after a while uh, because <clears throat> both of us shared a smoking habit too. So we'd be in that spot outside the con where all the smokers go together and we would talk that way. But it's funny. That's how I got to know Larry Elmore too. Fantastic artist. Um, I got to see him talk about his life at uh, Gary Con 2019. Fascinating stuff. Um, if y'all have never seen Larry Elmore, Larry, E-L-M-O-R-E, -E, put that in Google. And uh, just be prepared to be impressed. Well, and it gets and it gets worse because Larry's also a gearhead. Oh, so, okay. yes, he has an old car habit as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so sometimes we sit down and don't talk gaming at all. Well, that's that's fine because the gaming is a uh, it, it can be just the excuse to get to meet people, and then yes. you build relationships from there. And so why not why not do that? Why not build up friendships um, around this? Well, and I have, on occasion, I have bought second rights to Larry Elmore art, which, by the way, uh, budding manufacturers out there, Larry does sell second rights to his art, if you don't mind that it's been on the cover of something else before. Oh. Uh, and it's uh, it's no less gorgeous than the day he created it, let me put it that way. But it's a lot so, cheaper. Yes. And a lot cheaper, yes. Okay, well, that's neat. Cheap. And it's still Larry Elmore. It's not cheap, but it's it's cheaper. So before you got to working with Gary, it sounds like you there was years where you were just, you just knew the guy, you hung out with the guy. Yes. It sounds like he, um, he wanted to be helpful. He wanted to mentor, but he gave it to you straight. Yeah. Um, he didn't sugarcoat things. Uh, so what was the guy like? Was that, was that his approach? I don't know that teaching? that was his approach with other people. I, I really feel like Gary and I had a very unique relationship. Um, I, we would talk women for gosh sakes. So, and no, you don't get those stories here. No. <laughs> one of my favorite topics. And I know it's one of Larry Elmore's favorite topics too. Yes. If you, <laughs> when you Google him, be prepared for the chain mail bikini. He loves the ladies. Uh, God's gift to man. And thank you, God. But anyway, <laughs> um, the women. Uh, when, when, when we would, when we would talk, it was more, uh, it, it was more his colleagues. It was funny because I had a certain respect for him until I started working with him. I had a respect for him that would would I would say is him on a pedestal type thing. Sure. Um, he didn't like that. He did not like me addressing him that way, looking at him that way. He he is the one that said, "No, you know, we're just a couple of friends, and let's leave it there." So he's humble. Yeah, it, very much so. Very much so. Um, and just a, a regular salt of the earth kind of guy. He really was. Um, I, I almost forgot to mention uh, Gen Con 4, which was held at Parkside. Um, Gen Con 4 or 6, I can't remember. See, now I'm going to get a little confused. But one of those two, anyway. Uh, we had run, it must have been 6, because we had run the Inner City Tournament for two years. Harold, of course, had helped me organize it. Harold came over the second year and asked me if I wanted to work for TSR. Now, I'm 17. I'm in high school. I'm like, can I finish high school first? He <laughs> said, no. They want you there at the office right away. They've read some of your stuff. And, they, you know, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, no, I want to finish high school. And at the time I told Harold, I said, I'm going to be a lawyer, Harold. So I'm going to college. OK, I'm sorry. But if I have to be out of school to work with you guys, the answer is no. So 
looking back, was that a wise move? I don't, I don't probably. I don't. Probably because there's a chance you would have been seen as one of Gary's people. And I don't know how much longer past that invite was extended that Gary and his people got shoved out of the company. Yeah. Uh, we called that Black Sunday, by the way. Yeah. 19, whereas 19, if you're running your, if you're writing your own games and you're running your own hustle, the only person who could get rid of you is you. Oh, or that's, wife. True. that's true. And you do tend to get a lot of freelance offers, which fill in the spaces in between the revenue spaces in between um, so that your wife doesn't make you get a day job. Yeah. Although, well, well, I, I had a day job until I was until 95. So, yeah. Oh, okay. No, I was a customer house broker. You're a what? Yeah. <laughs> These days they call them logistics analysts. Oh. But basically I'm the guy that would set up international trade lanes, make sure that all the regulations were followed, file for duties and whatnot that were due to the government when you imported your products. Yeah. I don't really miss that job. I don't, I don't imagine they do. They make you old in a hurry. Yeah. A couple billion uh, dollars across your desk every day. It makes you old in a hurry. So were you... So you got to work with Gary much later on. What was it, about the 2000s? I mean, like directly we professionally? We began working together in 1997. Okay. Because TSR was going broke. They hadn't put anything out. And I mean, not even character sheets had they issued in like six months. Oh, I remember. I, I was at that point working with the guy that wrote their miniatures column, uh, Robert Bigelow. Okay. And Bob, if you watch this, yes, props to Rob. Okay. Um Rob. And, and I said, you know, I should write a, an adventure module. Because at that point, uh, Bob was working with me. I had written a number of micro games, pretty much three quarters of the Fuzzy Heroes line. And he was doing my sales for me. Okay. I said, I, sh I should write an adventure module for first edition. Well, you can't use their stats. I said, well, no, we'll use the inner city mechanics so that we don't wind up um, treading on thin ice. I said, but we'll write an adventure for first edition. Well, yeah, that there's space in the market for it. I mean, nobody's got adventures out right now. And I said, well, if we're going to make a splash, let me call my friend Gary and see what he says. So I called Gary on the phone, and I was like, Gary, do you want to write an adventure with me? Sure. Uh, I said, what do you what do you need? He said, am I going to just do like edit and co-develop? And I said, yeah, pretty much. Eh, 300 bucks. I wrote him a check that day. I sent it off in the mail along with the contract, and a yeah. challenge of arms was born. That you could get, that you could... That you could hire Gary Gygax for three hundred dollars. It, oh. it, it blows my mind. By today's standards, and, and you know, there's a couple ways to judge that. You know, how much does gas cost compared to then? How much is a new car? How much is a house? They, that would be about a thousand dollars a day, but that's still dirt money. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, that's friggin' and, crazy. So Gary actually wrote that one with me. Wrote the next one with me because he liked the storyline. Um, both for three hundred bucks, and then as I mentioned, I sent him Castle Wolf Moon. Because, oh, I didn't realize you finished that. Why haven't I seen this yet? And that one I paid him 400 because I felt bad. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, and, we're, we're starting working with Gary, like, directly in 1997. 97, yeah, 97. Um, I want to jump back in time just, to, uh, just for one question. Uh, while Gary was out in Hollywood and he had the big mansion he was written, uh, renting and the, and the wild parties, did he ever invite you to come along? He did not. He never invited thought, me out to Hollywood. Thought he was your friend. Didn't invite you. You know, to... I don't, I think he knew I didn't fit very well with that crowd though either. <laughs> to be honest. Well, and you were significantly younger. Good on Gary for choosing to not expose such a younger person to the world of debauchery. So again, morally upstanding. He had, he had a few regrets from his time in LA. Uh, and no, you won't get more than that. But yes, he had. A no, few. that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I just uh, I was just curious if anybody could, if anybody had stories of that time. I wonder what it's like to party hardy with Gary Gygax. His, his, I, th this story I will share. While he was out there, someone else at TSR handled the cartoon for D&D, &D, the licensing. Thunder the Barbarian uh, was originally supposed to be the D&D &D cartoon. Okay. And I, I don't want to mention the person who was in charge of it, but he went out there and screwed the whole deal up. And they were basically, we'll do it without D&D, the hell with you guys, because that's how Hollywood is. And so it was two more years before they cut a new deal for the D&D cartoon. But in case fans of D&D think Thundar is a pretty cool, you know, cartoon, and, and why was this never been, you know, that's why. Yeah. 
I did not know that. And, and that one I can share with you. And so Gary, one of Gary's regrets was that he was too busy doing other things and should have taken that under his wing personally because he would have resolved the matter in a better fashion than it was resolved. Man. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, see, you weren't there, but you still gave a good story related to his time in Hollywood. I appreciate that. Well, I, Gary and I shared a lot of things. We were friends. We shared a lot of things. You know, that's great. So y'all didn't lose contact. Y'all, y'all stayed in touch oh, throughout all the time. Most definitely. It was funny. Even after um, Heckenforge stopped being Heckenforge, uh, I would go up there every once if I do a new game. I I'd, I'd drive up there because Alex. I would give his son Alex, who at the time was fifteen or sixteen. I would give him a copy of the new game. And Alex loved it when I would come because I would drive up in my 1973 Charger with the big 440 engine. And and he's a gearhead. So, yeah. That's cool. That's Crush cool. his hair! <laughs> Dude, light him up. Light him up. Come on. You know, yeah, that was Alex. All right. So that covers the Hollywood era. And now uh, we're in 1997. You introduced us to the first products that y'all worked on together. And that was the legendary, uh, the legendary Journeys. Uh, well, actually, the first project we worked on were that module series, oh, yeah. the last of which was never published. But then Gary called me saying that he'd had a, a meeting with investors he had lined up to launch his latest role-playing game, and they had all backed out. And he oh, said, that's nice. if, I, if I give you this role-playing game and we form a partnership on it, do you have the bank account to launch it? And I looked at what he had, and I was like, well, geez, I can do this for about three and a half grand, so yeah. Whereas Gary okay. was used to work, well, Gary was used to working with larger companies like TSR. You didn't launch a new book for three and a half grand, 35 grand, sure, but not three and a half. And so he was amazed. We actually put out 14 books under Heckleforge. And I think we wound up $7,500 in the hole after all was said and done. That was it. Um, which I don't appreciate being in the hole, but you know, it wasn't bad for 14 books. That could have gone way worse. That could have gone oh, way yeah. worse. That's, well, that's, obviously, we made some money here and there. It just, it, it ended rather abruptly uh, compared to what it was supposed to do. And so it didn't have a chance to quite recoup its, you know, anyway. Understandable. Uh, now, you mentioned Hecaforge a few times. So that's, yes. uh, that was one of the companies that uh, you uh, you helped form. Hecaforge was a partnership between, and it wasn't, I'm sorry, it was not a corporation. It was a limited partnership. Okay. Interestingly enough, th let's just say there have been some license inquiries about how did I get away with publishing Legendary Adventure stuff. Well, the interesting uh, partnerships, you don't, none of the partners have to license each other. Uh, See, and I knew that going in. Uh, other folks that are involved with, how do I want to put this, arguments over the licensing did not realize that. They now do. So legalese so, makes a difference. It does. It does. In addition, uh, although I can no longer produce it because the other partner isn't around anymore, I don't have to surrender any of the material because it's all um, partnership work product. Uh, equal ownership of material. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So I can't do anything with it, but I don't have to surrender anyway. Hmm. And that, I, I got the feeling that's going to come up uh, very soon because... Um, it, already, it already has. And it's I mean, in the conversation. Well, yeah, and it's already been resolved as far as legally goes. Um, one of the reasons I married a lawyer. No, never mind. <laughs> I thought it was because she was your high school sweetheart. And you well, it was, cute. but, you know, it, the <laughs> fact that she's brilliant doesn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's cool. So who else, uh, who were the other partners in Hecaforge? Just, just Gary and I. Okay. That's yeah. all you need. Yeah. And, um. So you you worked with him in uh, later years of his role playing game uh, industry uh, career, and what was? Could you point to some like any changes in RPG philosophy he had, like the design of it, or was it just a natural evolution of what he was already doing? I think he just pushed his own limits a little bit. Um, he did more research. Oh, uh, Gary was a uh, well when he started. He dabbled in relating fantasy events to actual history sure yeah and it was it was well one of the funny things there's a there's a suit of armor in in one of our modules the, of the first three there and he came back and he said it, it's nickel silver so it'll never rust 
And I said, why would it rust? Well, it's got nickel in it. And I wrote him back and I said, no, Gary, nickel silver has no nickel in it. By the way, it doesn't have silver in it either. And he came back, what? Uh, yeah, nickel silver is actually a copper alloy. Oh, then he started doing research. He did not like the junior partner knowing things he did not. So he started researching more. He was absolutely steeped in knowledge about uh, ancient Egypt, um, Celtic lore. Um, but and, and it's reflected in his later work that you see there is so much more depth to, to the background stories that he writes and how the magic works and why this is this way. But it's all relatable to actual things, which aids, personally, aids in uh, immersion. And... Um... I read one of his one of his uh, nonfiction books, uh, Role Playing Mastery. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> excellent book. And yeah. um, his attention to detail is, I mean, every oh, my God, yes. sentence is it was fit. It was worthy of like a, a doctorate dissertation. Um, it is it's dense, but if you get the rhythm of it, you can flow along on it like a, like like you're tubing on a river. Uh, and there's so much to know in it. So there was, that was his high guy Gaxian was evolving into more like that. Yes. I, I want to 2006, 2007, when he was at the pinnacle of his writing, but his health was starting to go. Um, Shame. Instead of it being, oh, there are these cave snakes and they glow in the dark because they're cave snakes. And they have bioluminescence, which is based on this. You would get an entire page on the biology of the, the cave snake when it has its young how many eggs are there can they be preserved outside the nest yeah yeah just incredible and i was telling him this is meat and potatoes pal this is not boring this is nice and meaty people like this stuff because yes yeah, somebody's going to try and take a cave snake egg home believe me they are they are yeah. but players love doing that so if you compare that level of detail and exposition to say the against the giant series where he still leaves in little hints that right. you have to think about. And once you do, it tells its own story. He takes the time to tell the story of the details the longer he was writing. Exactly. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. Before we leave the Giant Series as a reference, oh, yeah. um, I actually I actually used a, a Giant Series reference in the Lance book that we're going to get to a little further down the road here. Um, they, there is a snack in the future called Big Beefy Smacks. <laughs> and, and and fans of the giant series know where that's from that's all <laughs> and uh so um in later years was he still the same humble guy that you yeah. had known all the rest of the time um, he, he he became slightly more spiritual oh but okay that's about it seriously that's all that it. i mean no. it's, especially if you spend time thinking about life yes it makes a lot of sense that your journey would take you in that direction. Yes. Um, uh, I, I think he regretted not getting a few more things done while he was here. He felt like he had an unfinished to-do list. That's about it, really. Other than that, sure. man had very few regrets. And and I appreciate why. <laughs> you know, yeah. So you had another life lesson to everybody listening and watching from Gary Gygax. I spoke through his friend, Chris Clark, is that... Uh, you you might run out of time if there's something you want to do yeah. you better do it yeah you yeah. better get to doing it carpe diem because uh, the dm might not be there tomorrow yeah, yeah. It might not be you might not be able to carpe it yeah, exactly uh, anymore exactly. and speaking of um in a legendarily smooth transition speaking of carpe diem you've been putting out a whole bunch of games and uh, i've got to the pleasure of playing at least one of them own it proud owner of inner city potentially but, the oldest small press company still in existence Really? Yeah, actually, since Ooh. 1982. Wow. Wow. And, and actually, we weren't a company, but we actually produced our first product in 1979. So. That's Inner City Games. It was okay. an inner, It was the original version of the Inner City Game, yes. And now let me see if I can summarize what Inner City is about. Uh, currently in the Inner City Redux edition is that of all the cop dramas, 70s, 80s, and 90s, you get a play in that world. Um, all the rough edges of it, all the colorful characters, all the violence, all the kind of the exploitation flavor of those film genres as well, yes. all crammed in there. So if you're a fan of Shaft, there's plenty in there for you. If you've seen the wonderful TV series Sledgehammer, 
you're going to find <laughs> stuff to like in there. Heck, look, RoboCop, uh, Batman, all this uh, flavors from all these have percolated in, but not intellectually defensible property, just the flavor. Okay. Uh, but it's it's fun. It's a heck of a lot of fun. I, I think a RoboCop is actually called uh, Automaton Cop, but uh, yeah. Well, and they're all parodies. They're all parodies, which is which is a great big shield we can hide behind so we don't get sued. Uh, that's, that's important. But growing up in the seventies, right? I mean, you turn on the TV and it was all these just terrible police melodramas. The crooks never won, ever, and I, that just upset me. Well, I also had friends at school that wouldn't play D and D with us. Because it was unrelatable. It's all that weird wizard and dragon stuff. So we made this game where you could play a crook in a bad 70s cop show and everybody played. The whole I had half that high school plan at one point. So yeah. And believe me, folks, he has thought through what all a criminal might get up to in a setting like this. And uh it's 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 a heck of a lot of fun. Now wait a second, you were upset that the crooks never won? Why? Never won. Why? Why would that upset me? Yeah. Okay. Why would you play Dungeons and Dragons if you had no risk of dying ever? Beautiful. I love the point you're you're making right now. You know, I, how am I supposed to believe that this guy is a hero if he never loses? Exactly. You know, once in a while, he should have a tragic setback. And now, modern, uh, uh, I want to say like uh, Jack Ryan or what, they have occasional setbacks, don't they? Well, that's so that you understand the totality of their heroism when they succeed so that you appreciate it we only yeah. appreciate life because we know that there is death true story sadly yeah. um and the reward is commensurate with the challenge that it took to earn and if you right. didn't earn it and there was no challenge in getting it it's not really a reward is it so no. younger players 5e players embrace it embrace yeah. the hardship Trust me, you're going to have more fun the more you have to work to, yes. to triumph. Um, so, but Inner City, that's been around forever. Um, and it's a, a great game. Uh, if you're at a, if you're going to a convention that Chris Clark's at, he's definitely going to be running it. Um, uh, anything else you want to talk about that before we move on to your uh, sci-fi game? Well, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, we, we, did, we did do a second map supplement for that game. Uh, there are modules planned for the second map supplement. Now, what modules would those include? We have a military installation in the second map. Um, we have an abandoned chemical factory that has polluted the lake, which, of course, killed all the campers in the campground because those were popular themes in the 70s as well. Yes, it was. So, there might be zombies. You don't know. You know. There <laughs> might be toxic chemical spills. There might be ICBMs because we were all worried about getting nuked in the 70s. You know, yeah. Might there be uh, sh uh, shaggy vegetation covered uh, could be. of yes, that there, area? There could be. With uh, and I'm trying to think of the the nice young lady from Escape from New York. What was her name? Um, oh, crap. Yeah, she might be there too. Yeah, anyway, in parody, of course. Uh, um, and what another way that uh, folks might be able to experience this for themselves? besides playing at conventions or picking up a book and uh, learning to run it for yourself, is that uh, I've got a couple folks who had never played it before that hopped in on online sessions Chris was running. Yep. Go to his Facebook page. It's Christopher Clark. Go to the Go company ahead. Facebook page. We always list what free games we're running and when, and they're all dropping. Any first come, first serve. If we wind up with 30 people showing up for an eight-player game, there's going to be 22 disappointed people. But... Uh, they're, they're all free, and you don't have to know the rules we teach them. Don't worry. Yeah. And, and just come get a taste. Don't be surprised if you're playing Inner City and you die seven or eight times. It's part of the game. Just change the, the name of the character and get right back out there. Yep. Uh, you'll always be someone's cousin. And it's a really easy to access game because if you can play any edition of Dungeons & Dragons, except for maybe fourth, but if you can play any of those editions, you'll be able to figure out Inner City really quickly. Yes. Um, it's it's easy to pick up and play and a heck of a lot of fun. I highly recommend you all do it because uh, I think I have my copy. Here it is. Oh. See? Yeah. There you go. All right. And the maps are pretty. Now, <laughs> you're moving into space, though, with hard sci-fi. Yes. Indeed, uh, I am, sir. Lance. Tell us about Lance. Well, Lance came about because uh, I love playing uh, science fiction, 
it's funny, we would use D&D rules and play science fiction, Metamorphosis Alpha material, but I was never really crazy about the Metamorphosis Alpha rules because they lack character advancement. Other than that, they're fine. Okay. And I was also tired of Star Frontiers style soft sci-fi where there's kind of like magic in the fringes of, you know, and gosh, there's transporters. Okay. Well, I want to leave a booby trap in the transporter. How does it work? And that's the exact look you get from the GM. Yeah. Just kind of, I have no idea. It transports things, you know. It's magic. So what we did with Lance was we made it that any uh, form of science that you can find on Google, even th theoretical science, has been perfected for commercial use in the future. Now, why is this? Well, because all you have to do is look up on Google and figure out how it works. So if you are if you need to prep a little bit before the, the, the adventure uh, gets played with your friends, okay. Generally, believe it or not, you can do it on the fly if you bring your phone to the event. Um, I have trapped people, for instance, uh, chlorine gas is filling the area. Why chlorine? Well, it, it's an antibacterial, although it is also a, 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 a um, high oxygenator. That's not what they call them. The, it makes things rust. Oh, uh, oh, oh. High yes. oxidizer. Okay. Oxidizer. That's what I was thinking. Yes. Uh, it's a high oxidizer. And they'll start looking up chlorine gas on their phones to find out how you cancel it without causing an explosion or, you know, what, what do I need to, what, what's being risked by this stuff? Players will actually do that sort of thing while playing the game. Now you, did you get to play with this in Dallas? I didn't get a uh, didn't get to play it this time. The final event that I ran in Dallas, I had five PhDs at the table because the word had gotten out that there was this cool new hard sci-fi game. And I thought, sure, as, as game master, I was going to catch my, you know, Anyway, <laughs> that these guys were going to just just steamroll me, right? <laughs> it played beautifully. It played absolutely perfectly. So it, it's a system design, and it, I'll, I'll say this too: it's it's skill based. Um, okay. If you don't have a skill for what you're trying to do, there's a backup stat. And so, for instance, your hacker, computer coder, robot builder guy uh, has to jump because the uh, ship is pulling away, the airlock is still open, but 100 feet distance lies between you. You don't have a jumping skill, nobody does. So I would tell you, uh, your choice, take twice your dex or twice your strength and roll that number or less on a percentile and you make the jump. So that's how that's how we use stats as a backup. Um, literally thousands and thousands of character types because there are no, no character classes per se. Okay. Uh, there are primes, which basically prime is what was your life background. So you can have the kid who grew up working in the grocery store. You can have the ac academic. You can have somebody who enrolled in the military at a young age. Whatever the case may be, there's seven different primes that cover your background. I, I really, I enjoy the heck out of it just because it's a different, it's a narrative future game. You can play almost any of the Genres I've really gotten into lately that have shown up either on cable networks or on TV, like um, The Expanse or Firefly or, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the newer Star Treks, which are a little more science related. Um, and no, we don't have aliens in it yet. People, where are your aliens? Well, we don't have them yet. Well, 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 why don't you have aliens? Well, we haven't found them yet. Have you seen an article about the aliens we discovered last week? Uh, people are troublesome uh, enough. It's not Google. <laughs> it's not Googleable, so they don't exist yet. Uh, can I add aliens to my system? Of course you can. Yeah. Uh, there are only two systems in it right now, Rigel Cantaris, which is also known as Alpha Centauri, and of course the Sol system that we all live in. Um, and we use, uh, to shuttle between the two systems, they use wormholes made by something you can look up called an Abercrombie drive. That's actually on Google. <laughs> so, Interesting. I, nothing if not a man of my word. Okay, maybe I'm nothing, but you know, anyway. Um, we've already put out uh, shape, uh, the shipbuilding supplement book for it. We put out the known installations of the Sol universe because regardless, you'll, you'll put together a wonderful adventure series for how the storyline that the characters are supposed to follow and they won't. They'll steal a ship and head off to Mars. And guess what? If you've got the known installations, you've got all the information you need on Mars, including right down to what stores are there in one of the four Mars bubbles and who runs them. So, yeah, they're fairly detailed. So Mars has bubbles because we haven't fully terraformed it yet. May not be able to, but all of the, hard all science. Of the, 
all yeah all of the planets actually that are not earth have bubbles okay uh, with the exception of venus because the bubble on venus would would not be able to withstand the atmosphere Ooh, so, so you don't have like cloud cities where it like uh, you have a bubble city skirting along the top of the atmosphere of Venus. No, um, okay. the v the Venus colony is underground and it's a penal colony. What a shock! That is the Merkaba yeah. penal colony. The so, more you learn about Venus, the more it being a penal colony sounds pretty. Sounds right. Yeah, pretty, pretty right. It's uh, a place and, and believe, believe it or not, there are bubbles on Mercury because that's possible, but not Venus. Um, there is a bubble on Jupiter, but it's not on the ground. It, it hovers about 13 miles below the surface. It's a, a round bubble, and it hovers in the gas at a pressure that allows for certain manufacturing process to be much cheaper because you've got, you know, 130 atmospheres of pressure there. It's like you've thought through this. Uh, it's possible that I looked up some stuff on Google. <laughs> so how do we get uh, uh, traveler fans? How do we get them hooked on Lance? Uh, we just get them to play. Yeah. Uh, there there are no torque grenades that you can't throw far enough to get out of the blast radius on. So uh, <laughs> uh, there is a very nice selection of weapons. Obviously, there's laser rifles. Uh, one of our favorites is the ice rifle because there's no ballistics left over. It's a favorite assassin's weapon. It shoots a jot of liquid nitrogen and water into your rifle. Because it does that, of course, it wants to expand immediately, which is what powers the weapon. And then this pellet of ice comes out the end that goes through about an eighth inch of steel because it's traveling at Mach 3.2. And yeah, we actually did the equation to figure that out. It, hard science, baby. Hard, hard science. science. Not hand waving crap. It's got you. You need to. It needs to be feasible in some provable way. Correct. And then it but can show up. Again. That if you have a character, ask me how it works. I can explain it to you. Because maybe you want to modify it because you looked up something else on Google. And can you modify it? You bet you can. Now, I'm going to make you make a skill roll, but yes. So getting back to that uh, original statement you made about what pulls people into role-playing games, this sounds appealing in that there's so much that people understand about technology or don't understand about technology, but if you just made this one little change, maybe yep. it could change the world, and this is a game that encourages you to do that. Well, and leveling-wise... Every time you use one of your skills five times successfully, it goes up a point. Is there a limit to how high it can go? Nope. Now, a zero zero roll always fails, and an 01 is always a, a monumental success, which, you know, you can have to buy the book to find out what those mean. You can wind up having a hacker skill of 125%. That doesn't mean that the computer you're trying to hack into has an AI that causes it to give a negative 45% to your skill roll. Those types of things do occur. Yes. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, if you come next year to Dallas, I promise you, we have an entire ship in 28 millimeter with little figs that we're going to play with. And it's just, you won't want to leave. You'll be like, just have our dinner brought here. So. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah, I was, I was bad. I didn't line up with any games with you this time, but uh, next year, next year, at least I'm not, hurt. I'm not hurt much. It's okay. Next time I see you, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> we'll hug it out. Lance is probably the most, if not only, um, totally serious game I've ever written. And it's it serious as a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. I, Trade Wars is kind of serious. The rest of them, yeah, not so much. The rest of the 112, yeah, not so much. Yeah, like Fuzzy Heroes? Fuzzy Heroes is not a terribly serious game. So let me get, see if I got this right. Fuzzy Heroes is a yeah. game that you probably already have the figurines to play with especially if you have small children in the house yes. uh, because you take whatever stuffed animals or plastic toys i think are okay under yep. certain circumstances and those are your figures and you play like the the battle mat is your house uh, it can be the backyard we actually did one we did one in a pool the pool filled yes so there was yeah, like we, we floaty played, gators well, there, there, there is a there is a uh, Age of Sail supplement called Plastic Ships and Fuzzy Men, and uh, yeah, we have that one. So, what uh, are these what what are these uh, stuffed animals doing in a role playing game? What do you do with them? You investigate, you know, like what's behind the the, the refrigerator. In in the one module that I have yet to publish, uh, called the F Files, you learn of an ancient tome that none, of course, no mortal should see. That's locked in a closet in the main family room. 
It's called the TV Guide, okay? And you're not supposed to look at it, of course, because it lists adult programming. And so we'll corrupt your fuzzy heroes if they see it. But that that, that was our, uh, our our nod to the fans of Cthulhu and Cthulhu-like role-playing. So uh, we have Undeads. Uh, there, there's Vix the Inhaler, the best-known uh, ancient vampire for the system. And they're not Undeads because nothing dies in Fuzzy Heroes. It goes to sleep. So they're the unslept. And so this we game have, is perfect for any age. Well, it, you know, it's funny. I was a huge Games Workshop uh, for, Warhammer fan. Huge Warhammer fan. Except it cost like three or $4,000 to play. They started upping the prices on it. And I thought, you know, this is going to be one of those games where I see the same people across the table for the next 20 years and we all get older together and then the game goes away. Yeah. How do we get more people that are young involved in gaming? Also at the time when Fuzzy Heroes first came around, 1990, 89, 90, okay. All the parents were worried about kids disappearing in steam, steam tunnels because of the D&D game. You know, yeah. games are evil. Yeah. And so I went to the store owners and I said, okay, here's a stuffed toy game with no death. I defy you to find a parent that finds this objectionable. Was it fun? And so then we'd go play one in their back room and they would come out saying, this game comes with everything but beer, you know, and, and yeah, and we wound up selling some. We subdivided it so that when you read through the Fuzzy Heroes series, there's sections that are story that explain the rules. But they're offset in italics, so if the kids are getting tired and you're not going to wind up playing anyway, you can just finish reading the story for them. And then know when to stop without having to actually go through the rules. If you're playing with your college friends over a six-pack, you can skip the stories and just do the rules. Either way you want to do it. But you know, There's actually nice. six six Fuzzy Heroes books out there. And taking a look at your, your game catalog, it looks like there was a lot of creativity that went into just how the games are set up. And that's a, that's a perfect case in point. Say you don't have three grand to get into mini games because that's that's one of the reasons I stayed away from miniatures games is because they were pretty much tied to how much you were willing to spend on them, kind of like Magic the Gathering. And I'm broke, so uh, I couldn't any, do it. Any, any game where you can buy a bag of figures at the dollar store, I have probably made miniatures rules for. Yeah. Uh, Whether it's pigs, insects, I yeah, insects war, war Pigs is War with Plastic Infantry Guys, P I. Gee, yeah, okay. and fuzzy heroes. You don't have to buy any more nope. stuff. You, you can take a styrofoam cup, draw a face on it, stick a pencil through it. It's ready to fight. There you go, right there. <laughs> it's Christopher Clark, ladies and gentlemen. Right, let me adjust my ascot real quick. I gotta gotta look perfect, and uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting nice and uh, primped and and proper here because. During the course of the interview, we've uh, gotten word that some of the viewers were overheating with with uh, with the vapors, and so we had to change outfits to throw them off. And so that's why uh, that's sure why that's we look that's... different than the last uh, segment we were talking in. Are you sure that's not a new recreational chemical? The vapors, you know, it's... volatilized. Oh, do you... I don't know something. Do you have rules for that for the vapors <laughs> in <laughs> inner city? Give me 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, so, do have drug, we do have drug use rules, which was one of the reasons a lot of stores didn't want to carry it back in the early 80s. Um, none of them are beneficial to your character for the most part, because I, I'm not a big believer that recreational chemical use is good for you. But, you know, it's still stores like you put drugs in the game. That's terrible. And it's like, well, I suppose we could just say, gee, drugs don't exist, you know, but, uh, you know. Yeah, in a, in a game about street level thugs and criminals and criminal enterprises, drugs don't exist. And you know, I, I view them as one of the additional tools you put into the rule system to generate chaos. Yes, because definitely. playing in a game of Inner City, it's it's madcap. You never know where the day is going to take you. Not that you would ever play again. <laughs> Next time you do, and you find you find drugs on one of your victims, so to speak, uh, don't take them. But use them as a bribe and chide your enemy into being, you know, too wussy to take drugs and go into combat because it will mess him up and then <laughs> take him down that much more readily. Yeah. See, this is what I'm talking about. This guy's got a brain for design and just, yeah, the stuff's, the stuff's interesting. And but I want to tack back for a second to uh, uh, the fuzzy heroes, because while we were uh, getting more appropriate for, I guess, YouTube, you mentioned something real interesting about uh, fuzzy heroes related to cartoons 
Oh, while working with Gary, Gary uh, hooked me up with his Hollywood agent, which happened to be the Thompson Star Agency, and in fact was Joey Thompson. Not actually a coincidence that it's Thompson Star and that Joey's last name is also Thompson. And I signed all my paperwork at, you know, Joey gets 15% of me, whatever else. Sent him a big old raft of games, most of which at the time was Fuzzy Heroes. And he actually had nibbles for a Saturday morning cartoon for Fuzzy Heroes. Now, I'll tell you as well, I'm reasonably certain the guys, the digital cartoons for Disney, who am I thinking of? Pixar. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a copy of Fuzzy Heroes on the Pixar shelf somewhere. A lot of the, the world of Monsters, Inc., for instance... There are many similarities to the world of Fuzzy Heroes. Not enough that I would consider it to be more than parallel development, but by the same token, I don't worry about them suing me because I did it first. But yes, and anyway, it, it didn't pan out because, uh, frankly, while they wanted to give me $30,000, which by today's standards is about $65,000, uh, for the cartoon for two years license, they want to take my name off of it. And if you ever want to be somebody in Hollywood and, and be the go-to guy for scripts and whatever else, you don't take your name off stuff. You just don't. That was the first lesson Gary taught me. Why would they want to do that? To puff up the resume of someone either less talented or just starting out. Happens all the time. Uh, yes. yes, happens all the time. They weren't necessarily going to claim they wrote it, but theirs was going to be the only name attached to it. And so... Uh, uh, all I insisted on was the end credits would have developed from Fuzzy Heroes by Christopher Clark. That was it. And they balked at that. So, so this was this was somebody that wanted to get known for doing something they really didn't do. Yes. That's really interesting. And so you turned down a sizable chunk of change to then not have to do any more work for them to go and do the, the right. series, I suppose, because they were just going to take your property and then... They're going to have. They wanted, I guess. they wanted the rights to all the stories, all the merchandising, all the everything. I was on board yeah. with that. I mean, this is the other thing people don't understand about folks who design games for a living. These aren't our children. Will we sell them? Of course we will. You know why? I'll get up tomorrow. I'll do it again. But that's what you're in the business <laughs> you know, of. Yeah, tomorrow's a new day. I'm not going to do the same stuff I did yesterday. Tomorrow, I'll do different stuff. And so. Everything is for sale all the time, depending on the auspices under which it would be purchased. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But and why it, was that such a line in the sand for you that taking your name off of it, that was a deal killer for you? Because one of the one of the one of the visionary images of who I wanted to be was a go-to guy for Hollywood to say, geez, we need a script for this this new expanse thing. Who do you know? Oh, what about this Chris Clark guy? You know, he wrote that fuzzy heroes thing. You know, um, and that those conversations occur with a certain degree of frequency on the West Coast. Uh, I'm trying to think uh, the guy who wrote Buffy. Who's, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He's a brilliant guy, but people turn to him all the time because he's known to be a brilliant writer and storyteller. Josh Whedon. Yes, Josh Whedon. And, yeah. and I, I, I loved I can't be Josh Whedon because, well, he's better at this than I am. But um, by the same token, that that's how you build your your base, if you will. Build and your you brand. Build your base by selling somebody else the cement for the foundation. You just don't. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because that's an interesting re wrinkle that uh, anybody engaged in a creative enterprise that might be or watching this, be, something to think about. What would you do in this situation? Because if you stick to your craft, you put in the work, you start getting noticed, you start getting some traction, where are you willing to go from there? And well, I'll, I'll, I'll take you one step further. Do it. Copyright, as you know, I have all my stuff copyright. I'm protected. No, you're not. No, you're not. Copyright is such limited protection as to be these days, especially nearly worthless. However, when you go to court and you say, um, I've got Stephen Clement's uh, online show that um, these guys absolutely just ripped off. Look, it's even got the same name. And 50 people walk, you, walk into court, watch both shows and go, oh, that's Stephen Clement's show. Now you win. All the time, you win. But what's the key there? Well, it's getting that fan base and a broad enough uh, swath of people to know your work as a certain style and or trademark. And once you've got that, oh, I forgot to copyright something. Well, okay, so what? They're going to swoop in and take it. And I, I don't want to use Ernie as an example, but that's one of the misunderstandings I think Ernie has in terms of copyright and trademark is that, oh, well, they've let their trademarks uh, slide. So now we're TSR. 
No, you have TSR's trademark, but people know better, Ernie. And, you know, put something out there that looks like TSR, maybe they'll have some confusion, and then you'll wind up in court. <laughs> but, and know. by Ernie, you mean Ernest uh, Guy Guy. Uh, Ernie Guy Guy. Um, I love Ernie dearly. Great sweet guy. guy. Yeah, and good writer. But he's he's confused at times when he thinks you can just buy a trademark and therefore for buy the company. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, had I noticed the same thing they had noticed better believe I'd have plunked down my what $70 or something like that oh, to sure. get the trademark. I would, I would have bought, I would have done the same thing. And there's, Oh, a I would have done the same thing, but I would have done made the call and say, you guys want this back. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, made $350 on it and said, well, that was a good day's work, you know, and then go back to writing something new. Yeah. Having steak tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to touch a couple other games, uh, sure. game titles that popped out from the list on your site, which we're going to link in the description below. Who's your daddy? Who's your da you made a game called Who's Your Daddy? I, I did. And you, you asked me once uh, earlier uh, off camera, what was my favorite game at a con? Believe it or not, the favorite, the most fun I ever had at a con was playing Who's Your Daddy at Origins. I want to say 2010 ish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I had the head of Columbus, Ohio's. Aid to single women with babies and dependent families and all that. The head of their social programs department wanted to play because he was ready to be outraged, right? Okay. I had a nice black woman play with her daughter. I had a couple of tousle-headed uh, teenagers uh, that were obviously fresh out of college and clueless. And but we and we had a full table, but it was hilarious because everybody role played it. It's not a role playing game. It's just a social interactive game. The idea is you play both a man and a woman. We, we're not sexist. Get pregnant, crank out as many kids as you can, and sue all of the other players for child support. Now, because there's no input of, of income to the system, it's a closed economic system, right? The zero-sum game. It Right. It's a law of decreasing returns. So the idea is you find out who owes you the most money for your kids, and you protect them by suing other people into oblivion before <laughs> they can latch on to your sugar daddy. And oh my goodness, did we have a? And the funny thing was, the gentleman that headed up Columbus's social welfare programs clapped me on the back when we were done. He said, "That is the most fun I have had at a gen at, at an Origins in ten years." He said that was a fantastic game. But then again, it, it's not a terribly serious game. It's it's all about you know, the the one lady with her daughter. Her daughter says. Mama, I just accused him, and he's got to pay me six hundred dollars now. And the girl's about twelve. As long as your mom's there, and she says it's okay, I'm okay with it. But the mother looks at me, and she goes, "I'm not being responsible. I can't be a father now." And she just starts going up, and oh my god, the whole table roared for about five minutes. <laughs> it was just hilarious. I, wherever you are, darling, you have a seat at my table anytime you want to play. <laughs> so, so. So the game isn't set up to encourage role playing, but what when the players occur, yes. were confronted with the characters and thought about, you know, how I'm going to approach this, they on their own decided to get into those roles to explore yes. what it's like being those people, and that made that took the game through the roof. But they love they love mocking, uh, you know, the, the the deadbeat dads, if you will, especially. It's a whole nother. It, I, I tell people, I wrote it PG, okay? There are some adult themes here, but it gets played R all the time. You know, sure, I remember that night at the hot tub, but he went first, and it's like, oh, my goodness, okay. <laughs> you can't control your players, right? Can't once you get, once Nordic, the game starts. That's right. And, and nor, nor do you want to. It's, it's their game that you're playing on their behalf so that everybody has a good time and sees how much fun something like that can be. Turns into improv acting, no script, and uh, that's that's hysterical, dude. That. That's awesome. I'm going to have to play that. Uh, I'm really. going to have to send you a pregnancy card because on your turn, one of the things you can do is say, I'm going to become pregnant, and then you get a pregnancy card. See, but I have to send you one for your desk. You know? Well, there's reasons the Jerry Springer show was so huge because of this drama. The Maury Povich show yes. even like existed for, what, decades because of this, this I, I topic seem, right here. I seem to remember that the examples in the book are on the Maury Springer show. So, yeah, you know. Because, I mean, if, if you're going to get sued, might as well get sued by two different TV shows. You know? <laughs> no, no, I'm not challenging either one of them's intellectual property rights. This is a whole unique character, Maury Springer. <laughs> or or maybe it's, uh, you know, protected under... Um, satire. Uh, 
Center. For more advice on how to file the serial numbers off of intellectual property, <laughs> just message Chris Clark. Him and his wife can uh, can advise you <laughs> for for money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also lemmings in space. Lemmings in space, yes. Like the, little rodents in space. Don't 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 hate me, but it's the game that makes kind of sort of fun of suicide. Um, the idea being, well, I know. Well, you're just not. I'm a, nothing's off limits for you, is it? Yes, you're captain of 36 lemmings, and the first one to kill off his better crew wins. In in uh, strategic terms, it's about um, positioning your spacecraft so that everyone wants to shoot you instead of someone else. You want to get uh, shot in a game? You want In this game, you want to get shot. You want your shields to crash. You want the interior of the ship to go on. You, know, you want the warp drive to overload. Um, you, there are some activities where if you're behind and you can't manage to become the best target, you can still kill off a few lemmings, like exploring hostile planets. Uh, one of their sports is called sun diving, where you dip through the corona of a sun and see how many people die of radiation. And, well, they're not really people; they're lemmings. But you know. Yeah. Now, what was your, what was the design concept that led you to have that be how you indicate victory? In oh, a game? I, I'll tell you, but it's so boring. Okay, because it involves chess. Have you ever played reverse chess? No. Giveaway chess is quite an intriguing game, and it inspired Lemmings in Space. The idea being, you're used to tactical combat games where you just blow the guy out of the sky, right? Right, yeah. How about the tactical combat game where you have to get him to blow you out of the sky? In other words, because it, it involves backwards thinking, it's it's a very challenging game because you have to plan several turns ahead to be at the right point at the right time with the right threat. Well, that, and... That neat. and as the audience has no doubt noticed, as I told them would would come about, Mr. Chris has a wicked sense of humor. I don't think he can even turn it off, even if he wanted to. <laughs> um, so if he's in the electric chair, he's got a hood, his hood on. He's gonna crack some sort of joke. Well, and the thing is, you have to you have to put a solid game behind the jokes, though. If it's yeah. only good, if it's only fun to play once, you haven't really designed a good game. But the way you took a familiar concept, turned it on its head, and then gave it different window dressing, the element of surprise. For yes. a joke to work, the element of surprise is almost required. Because if you don't surprise somebody, if you don't trip that wire in their brain where they weren't expecting you to go, they're not going to laugh as hard. But this guy has the element of surprise. But one I don't think you had on your list, and I, I won't go far afield, oh, sure. but uh, the, the third game we did was a humor game called Space War. Right? You know, oh, it's got to be like Lemmings. No, it's uh, Los Angeles, city of six million cars and one lousy parking place. <laughs> so, yes, and hence space work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that whole game is about gently nudging people into the, the space that's ahead of the one parking space that's available, because of course that's like the handicapped space or the no parking fire zone space. Yeah, and trying to get everybody else's cars towed. So that you win the game. Yeah. I'm confident anybody in a big city, especially LA, uh, <laughs> San Francisco, Boston, uh, Seattle, any of those places will relate to the to the rage and the motivation of just move, get out of that spot. I'm, I need to go right here. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the game awesome. revolves around the fact that there's never enough hours in the day to eat, sleep, keep your car on the road and find a safe parking space so that you can go to sleep or to work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh man now you uh you had shared with me that the next kickstarter you plan on doing is for yes. a game called corporate the game of office politics tell oh, us about I, that I, I was a logistics analyst for like 16 years and i dealt with at least every fortune 500 company that that was on the list 10 years ago i don't know if they're all still on the list because thank god i've been out of it for a while the the lack of integrity in the upper levels of many, not all, but many of this country's corporations will make you just want to grab an AR-15 and go to town. Uh, thankfully, I'm older than that and wiser. So I grabbed a, a computer and I designed corporate the game of office politics instead. But it's all about dirty tricks that you play on people in the office so that you get all the credit for uh, projects that get completed and they get all the blame for projects that are completed improperly. And it, it, don't play with friends to start with. Play it with enemies. Yeah. And then if you like think Monopoly, friends are mature huh? enough, go ahead and play with friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 96 card deck. We originally made 20 hand cut 
hand laminated decks because I needed a cash flow patch for the company back in 1988, 1989. And they, we blew through them on Friday at Gen Con. They were just gone on Friday. So, so this game concept's been around for a while, but oh, you're yeah. resurrecting it. We want to, uh, we want to put some decent art on it. Okay. Uh, bad clip art on it. And yeah. Uh, flesh out the rules a little bit more. I, I, I think there's one or two dirty tricks I could still add. Not just give everybody else your work or take credit for what they've accomplished, but you know, maybe draw in some outside forces that will also, you know, like cancel can cancel culture type stuff. That's what I'm thinking. So mod yeah. modernize it for the current era. <laughs> Say I, I can relate to the vicissitudes of office politics. And I know that there's a big audience out there for Dilbert from Scott Adams. So again, there's a, a rich vein of public sentiment and emotion tied up in just this concept. The, the audience for it's got to be pretty, pretty sizable. You just got to get it to them. One of the first three modules, none of which have been published for Lance that I wrote, uh, is a module where there is a disturbance in the asteroid belt. Um, a guy calls you in because he's been told that because they've lost two scout ships trying to investigate it, no more resources will be put towards it, and he just needs to solve the problem. As his commanding officer looks over at a bank of uh, fire the nuclear missile switches, the commander says, yeah, we have a few uh, prospectors in the area that I don't want to have responsibility for their deaths. And the commander says, well, I, that's up to you. That, that is really the epitome of a corporate, the game of office politics scenario, where your boss wants you to handle something that will devastate your career but they don't care because of course they will be arms length away from it. Yeah. 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 As a uh, person who works in, in a government job for my day job, I believe there's also a tactic that can happen in office environments and tell me if the uh, card deck addresses this, of uh, something's too successful and adding too much value, but the idea didn't come from the right person. So it has to be kiboshed. Yes, there are ways to, what is that called? That is called, <laughs> it, it you destroy a project that's successful yes yeah 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 uh, because it, at at the point at which you want to destroy it of course is the point at which you can no longer steal the credit for it once you pass once you pass that plateau now it's time to throw the destroy the project card on it yes ah. otherwise the other guy gets too many points for it ah ah see it's a nasty uh, game, dude it's a really nasty game Industrial psychology with Christopher Clark. See, I told you this guy knows stuff and he's interesting. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to meet him, and I suggest that you do, or just send him a message. He, he drops stuff like this just casually, tidbits, uh, insights into human nature. And we'll be at Phoenix time. Con for those who, who care. But, you know, yeah, that's our next, our next con is Phoenix Con this July. So, yes. Well, we'll get to that in just one minute, yeah. but let's stick on the topic of uh, corporations. As we touched on, you've done a lot of work with others like Troll Board Games, Fireside Creation, TSR, Total Reality Studio, Wingnut Games, Goodman Games, uh, Eldritch Enterprises, Gax Works. So people like working with you. That's a good sign. Or you successfully con people in succession, one of the two. Well, yeah, either that or I'm, I'm just really cheap. <laughs> 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 Listen, they still charge like much. Go to Chris, you know. Yeah. Hey, that works. Do you have any memories that stick out from working with all those uh, different oh, entities or adventures you're particularly proud we, of? We've or got you about six on this call yet. So, um, <laughs> and that that's a lifetime. You know, I love Joe Goodman. He's probably the easiest guy to work with. Uh, Stefan is one of the most sincere people to work with. Luke is just an old friend, and he called me because they were on deadline for their third tournament module for GaryCon 8, 7. And so they were, could you help us get this, you know, to press in time? And I basically then worked with him on all of the tournament modules for GaryCon. That's where the GaxWorks link is. Uh, until 2021. 20, so, yeah, uh, uh, Luke and I have developed probably 11 or 12 modules together. And that's uh, Luke Guy Gax. Yeah. Uh, the my my I think my favorite was the Nazi one. Um, well, this is okay. This is the strange part. Usually, when I develop an adventure, I will write the adventure. I'll find an artist. And we'll get a cover. Luke works the opposite direction. Luke gets a cover and writes a module for it. I get that. I get <laughs> okay. that. Well, yeah. one year he was he was given a comic book like cover of a group of orcs, a wizard, and and a troll or two 
that were attacking some Nazis on the front covers. The module for that one is called Nightfall. And so we actually did a portal to Nazi Germany where if you get everything sealed up correctly, you get to go back to your fantasy realm and you shut down the ability of the Nazis to pull fantasy magic through this portal. And so, of course, you help the cause against Nazis. But yeah, Nazis are just the best villains because no, people yeah. don't, they don't really bat an eye of disbelief when it comes to them being involved in anything. Well, and there's nothing you can do to a Nazi that's bad. You know, it's oh, really dude, that's, hard that's to beyond do. the pale. That's no, there is no such thing. Not to a Nazi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just so, been asked just long enough that he can still talk. Yeah, that's okay. He's a Nazi. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, what what character doesn't want to be the guy that gets to fire the cannon from the tiger? Uh, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. No. I'm yeah. in control. But yeah, the Nazis, morally reprehensible though they are, they had cool stuff. They did, yeah. And they had, I mean, their suits were designed by Hugo Boss. I mean, if you're into men's fashion, you that's can take, kind of a big name. You can take the MG-42 back to your fantasy realm with you. Unfortunately, ammunition is hard to come by. Go find you some dwarves or some deep gnomes. I'm sure you can oh, figure that, that out. That, that, that's, your, that's your, I have a one shot to maybe survive this. I'll use the MG-42 and the 28 bullets that it came with, you know, yeah. The big bad evil guy. We can't know. The prophecy says no weapon of this earth can defeat yeah. me. Well, you roll up with a panzer and <laughs> you get one shot. And if you hit him, prophecy there, fulfilled. There you, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Black yeah, the troll yeah. lord guys, those Arkansas boys, the Chenault brothers. Uh, I, I love those guys. Yes. Davis and Steven. And, and we have known them pretty much since the inception of their company. I want to say, I think we met them at one of the open houses by the, by distribution where they bring everybody in and we do a dog and pony show for retailers. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't even know if they have those anymore. I've been out of distribution that long. So you're talking 25 or 30 years that I've known Steve. But I worked with them off and on on a bunch of things. They, of course, angeled the uh, legendary venture over to Troll Lords. Uh, it's funny, if you look at the early Troll Lords releases for legendary venture, you'll find my name in a number of those as well. So I actually cool. did a bunch of writing to help the transition over there. Anybody who thinks there was any bad blood between the Troll Lords and Hackaforge over the ship, no, not, not, not. In fact, I believe there were beers more than blood, but that's, you know, that's, that's about where that's at. Yeah. Steve, that's of cool. course, also recently did the, the Warden with Jim and I. It, it, it's, it's a book. Okay. Um, Metamorphosis Alpha Pans for years have been designing their own Wardens because TSR, for whatever reason, Never put out a source book for Metamorphosis Alpha. They instead went right on to Gamma World. Yeah, Metamorphosis Alpha is Gamma World with a world that has limits because it's a spaceship. So Jim and I did the entire spaceship. Now, Jim doesn't do anything small. Jim's warden spaceship is 20 miles long by 8 miles wide and about 11 miles tall. M meaning, of course, it could never turn in space. It would just break apart. But... That aside, something like 700 pages, and we did that with the nice guys from the Troll Lords in a Kickstarter about two years ago. I've reaffirmed my relationship with Steve, and he's doing well. I, I know the SRD mix-up caused him a, a little bit of <clears throat> internal uh, discombobulation, but I think they're going to surface from that pretty well, too. Yeah, thanks, Hasbro. Really, really appreciate that. <laughs> but I tell you what, when uh, I, I met them at, at the one Gary Connor went to in 2019, and I'd been living in New England, uh, New Hampshire for several years, but I'm originally from the South where, where people speak God's English. And so when I went to the Troll Lord booth and I heard them Arkansas twangs, I was like, oh, oh, this is it's oh, like no, calm to my ears. People who understand you speak through your throat, not well, through sure your enough, nose. You're, you're home now, sugar. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> But Wisconsin people are good too. They're they're, they're a rare exception of, of yeah, uh, nice Yankees. recovery. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, cons, so what was your first con that you went to? Was it that one you mentioned where you met G yes. Gary? Yeah, that was my very first con. And then for years, the only other con we did was Gen Con. Gen Con was almost uniquely up till 1985, after which we added Origins. Oh, Origins was actually still small. So yeah, we uh, we added Origins to our Gen Con uh, tally because, uh, well, basically I got told by a number of my industry mentors, I think they'd be called mentors at that point, including the guys at Mayfair. We were good friends with them. 
there wasn't actually troll lords around yet, but there were all the guys at TSR still who were here and there because TSR was faltering, but still around. And they were all, no, you got to go to Origins, you're leaving money on the table. And I found that actually Origins was a whole lot of fun as well. Columbus is actually kind of a neat town, plenty of restaurants, good food, nice people. And it's not an arm and a leg for a hotel room, or at least it wasn't. I haven't been to Origins in a while. That's um, Columbus, Ohio, right? Columbus, Ohio, yeah. Good deal. Well, what, what drove me away from Origins was during the late 90s, they made it into the Magic the Gathering Fest. Yeah. You know, everything else was very secondary. And I was like, why am I giving you money to be treated like a secondary customer? Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, so, yeah. Understood. But, but it did it did broaden my repertoire of acquaintances to the point where I started getting invited to to shows. So and at this point you're going as just as Chris Clark, you did have- games, known for fuzzy heroes. And I'm trying to think if we had anything else out really by then. And we did, but not anything worthy of knowing. We had the generic game out and and uh any the horror was out, although it was in its previous incarnation, which was known as just another monster or the jam game. What's the most cons you did in a year? Because you've been on the con circuit for 11 years. That's I a did, lot. That's that a was lot. a lot. And in fact, my my not yet wife then came to me and said, we're not doing this again next year. And when she says something like that, I say, yes, dear. Yes, dear. And yeah. Good call. But we, yeah, we did the Superman con. We did the Akron con, which is called, I can't even remember. We did a number of open houses. We did Detroit Con that used to be hosted by Greenfield Hobbies. We did, and oh my goodness, I forgot what color my house was. You know, are we home? That's our house? Really? Oh, wow. Okay. You know, funny thing was, of course, at that time, we didn't have kids. I can't imagine trying to do that with kids. No. Uh, thankfully, ours are, are grown and moved out. But uh, at, at during the interim, they weren't. <laughs> so, yeah. Friend that I uh, gamed with for years. He was telling me about, he had another friend that he gamed with. And there's a before and after part of the story. The fourth part was his friend was bragging to him like, yeah, I've got a con a month lined up for the next four months. I'm just going to game all the, yeah, your face, don't yeah. give away the spoiler. It's going to be awesome. going to get all this gaming in. And so in a given month, that's, you know, anywhere between two and four, two, two and five days of game time. Right. Uh, but at the end of that four months, my friend checked back in with him. The, the guy said, I'm exhausted. I don't want to go to another con in forever. And so that you did 11 in a year is, in, whew, that's tough. Uh, and was he just attending to have fun or was he? Yeah, he was just stuff? gaming. He wasn't oh, even trying to sell anything. It's it's not four days a month if you're attending as a company because you've got two or three days packing time two or three days unpacking time, re-inventory, do all the tax work and you know all that stuff. So it's basically 10 days out of a month if you're doing one a month. And you don't get enough done in the office. That was the problem. Uh, even Gary came to me and he said, you're not getting enough done in the office at this point. So I said, okay. Yeah, that, so that must have been 2000. We did 11 cons. And 2001, we cut back to like eight. These days, I do, well, these days I do five. Uh, we might do six next year. I just just got that from Calgary Con, the Canadian uh, Game Con. A huge con compared to what I was expecting. It was like thirty thousand people. Oh That's yeah, a lot of folks. It was it was mini Gen Con size. But they're also thinking of adding a con in Toronto, so I might pick up those two next year. Gary Con, North Texas, North Texas, North Texas is a, is a must. I've been thinking of adding Total Con because I really like the guys at Total Con. I know it's a smaller con. I don't care. Angelia is she's just such a sweetheart. And I haven't the, been to TotalCon, but well, no. the friend I just mentioned, he goes yeah. to TotalCon every year. And so next year I'm thinking about all adding that. So North Texas and that. Well, and you know what? Maybe I can send you several hundred dollars and and have you go on my behalf or something. I don't know. <laughs> go and run some I can run some intercity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. So uh, no, no. Con, right. North Texas. And uh, you're uh, you, well, total. we've been doing we've been doing Phoenix Con because my good friend Cosmo Joe uh, Andy runs it. it. It's a smaller con. It is dedicated primarily to his live action role playing system, which is known as Arpex. You can find that on Google. It's actually a pretty cool system. Um, but it's you know, a, a, I, when 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 it comes to the end of the day. If the figures don't add up black in in the columns, uh, the wife looks at me and says, "We're not going to this con again, are we?" 
and and because she makes more money than I do, I have to agree. Yeah. So, uh, and then we're we're going back to game holes here, uh, because game hole game hole is almost one of those proof of life cons in Wisconsin. If you're not a game hole, your company is thought to maybe have gone out of business type thing. So interesting. And I like Alex. He's a nice enough guy. It's a fun con. It's a little on the pricey side, but we'll we'll, we'll do okay. We'll do okay. Got a lot yeah. of new products. Here, so i'd heard the game hole was a good one i haven't been um but but it's good good to hear that you you think highly of it yes well um i i will take the minivan i could put the seats down you could throw a sleeping bag in there and no i'm kidding <laughs> appreciate it it's in october november so it gets a little cold at night but <laughs> you you know you're from new hampshire so yeah 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 you were up to 11 you cut back and now you might be crazy. Now we're doing about, yeah, now we're maybe going to do six again. Six again, okay. But I, it's at the point now where I generally don't do shows I, if I have to pay to be there, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. because you're getting special guest comped to this yes. stuff. Yes, for most of these, yes. That's great. And so that covers the admission to the con. That covers your hotel. Badges uh, and booth usually. Yeah. Our general red carpet is they give us badges, hotel room, and booth. The rest of it's on us, and that's okay. And in North Texas, I know that you can't get into the main gaming area without passing by Chris Clark and <laughs> Miss Honey at uh, their at their inner city. Gary, you can't get uh, past them. Gary takes such incredible care of us down there, and and in deference to uh, Doug prior to Gary, uh, Doug Ray. Uh, they're just incredible. They're, they're family. They're, <laughs> that's not a con. That's like, I'm just going to see my Dallas man, you know. <laughs> well, last year, which was uh, my first year going to North Texas, one of the things you told me was that it, it might be your favorite con because, and then you, you went into it, and then I, I started looking at the numbers of, okay, number of attendees, number of special guests, you know, the luminary, right. the designers, the, the most interesting people in the room. That ratio is really rich at North Texas really rich like you could if you're just gaming you could easily make your whole schedule playing almost every session with one of these people doug, doug did his very best to make it the gathering of important designers that happens in dallas almost as though you know uh, it's the g7 of game designers if you will and and it's funny uh, a number of the guys are old enough now that they don't attend anymore because plane flights can be trouble problematic uh, Jim Ward wants to go over here, and I refuse to take him because he used to come with me. I keep telling him, Jim, I don't want you to have the memory of of you expiring in my van on the trip down there. Okay, <laughs> it's and, a long and, way. And, and then his wife comes over and goes, "Thank you for saying that." <laughs> so yeah, yeah, wow. she she will keep him around as long as possible. Believe me, she's a good kid. So and then some of those designers that I've got to chat with and and play with at North Texas. They say that this is the only con they go to anymore, but awesome. it's such a good one. Yeah. They're going to keep going to it. Like Stephen oh. Marsh, I think he's one of those people. That's that's the only one he's like definitely got on his list. He might show up at another one if it's convenient, but he's definitely going to North Texas. Well, and of course, we all want to put on the dog while we're there. We want to bring our best stuff to make sure we stay on the list. <laughs> that's, good. that's good. And the adventure that you ran in a set in a mall at this last, at this year's North Texas. Yes. I'm mad that I didn't get into that one. It was it was booked up, man. Oh, uh, I, I, I I don't know if you get to see the pictures of them all. I have to take a look. Yeah, we, we, we'll, we put some on on the North Texas site. Yeah, good deal, good deal. Um, I I will tell you that none of the hostages survived either session. Twenty three hostages. You're supposed to go in and save the hostages, but you discover that the, a truck that you've had commissioned built for your gang, is, uh, they were trying to get it to you without you having to pay the taxes on it. So you were supposed to walk into the uh, the mall, be the one millionth customer, and win the truck that you've already paid for, right? Well, yeah, both groups decided that um, the truck was heavily enough armored to withstand, in the first case, a flamethrower attack, which unfortunately killed all the hostages. Um, and in the second one, an RPG-7 attack, which unfortunately killed all the hostages. And this was an inner city scenario, right? Yes, yes. Okay, there's just a, a little drop. In addition to all the other flavor we've put into this interview about what you could expect out of an inner city game. Uh, well, <laughs> horribly self-centered criminals, although I will say they did get the experience for the uh, for the hostages as well. Yeah. Uh, working the con circuit, a lot of setup, a lot of prep time, 
And then when you're at the con and the shelling your products, it's you're on all the time. You don't really get to relax, right? Pretty much. Yeah. That's, yeah. Cause that you're correct. in sales mode. You're, so you're I come money. home, I come home on the Monday and sleep for 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's rough on you. And I imagine eat all the garbage that's usually available around the con. I actually can't eat fast food when I'm on the road anymore. I can eat it once. Yeah. If I eat it twice, I'm screwed up gastronomically for the entire con. So I have to eat it at, at slightly finer restaurants, whether that's comped or not, just because if it's not good food, my system lets me know in a hurry. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about this because folks need to know about Christopher Clark's gastrointestinal health, but just to get folks an idea of what life's like on the con circuit, what, what these designers, what these small businesses are putting themselves through to try to show you a good time. Well, um, and I would imagine you fly down to Dallas. We yeah. can't, there's no way I'm flying my whole company down to Dallas so that we can have a booth. So we actually drive like 16 hours to get down there. And, and that's tough. And, well, thank God my wife is is amenable to doing the vast majority of that driving. But yeah. You know. Now, does she go to every con with you or just a few? No, uh, the ones she likes. <laughs> so she went to Canada with me because she wanted to go to Canada. Um, we may also, I'm sorry, we may also add Hawaii con to this year's repertoire. Uh, because I, I'm, a, yeah, so-and-so says they want to try and get you out of Hawaii con. And, you know, the wife doesn't say it like that. She says, we'd like you to get to Hawaii con. You know, why and, not? And, uh, honey, were you thinking of accompanying me? I might. Does that happen in uh, Honolulu? Um, Actually, I believe it's on the Big Island, but it's not Honolulu. Um, okay. Is that the one that uh, Jeremy runs? It was. I don't know if it is. Okay. Because I've got Jeremy saying, you know, come out to Hawaii, mostly because I just want to spend some time with Jeremy. And I've got this other guy telling me, oh, there's a con that I, I got you an invite to. Let me tell you the details. And I'm not sure they're talking about the same con. Ah, a lot, okay. a lot of stuff happens in Hawaii. So okay, well, cool. It's like, it's like, are you, you know, are are you going to the uh, the trade show in Las Vegas? Okay, you're gonna have to narrow that down. <laughs> Which one? Yeah, there's only about 300 trade shows a year. You know. Yeah, so. and especially if you could get comp to go into a con in Hawaii, that would be that would be worth it by itself. Because during the the COVID repeated lockdowns in Hawaii, there was a sweet spot where they opened up a little bit. And me and the wife went down there, and that was probably the cheapest anyone could ever visit Hawaii mm. at. Uh, we didn't lose our shirts on the hotel and the food, and this that had a great time. Hope you. I, I'm, hope well, you I'm, not, that. I'm not a big tropicophile, I guess is how you'd say that. Uh, I, I I enjoy Las Vegas and and for instance Disney more than I enjoy uh, Jamaica. Okay, so. But yeah, I, especially because my wife would really like to go, and I'd kind of like to visit Jeremy at his house, yeah. the one that's not covered by lava. He didn't Does he have that? one that got covered by lava. Oh, yeah, yeah. He uh, he got lavaed out about five years ago. Yeah. Dang. Well, <laughs> R.I.P. to Jeremy's house. Um, he's doing okay. Well, but, good. Well, I saw him at North Texas, so we, yeah, <laughs> thankfully he didn't lose okay. any, any family members. Just a lot of stuff, though. He lost a lot of stuff. Ah, that sucks. Ah, sorry to hear about that. If you're going to see if you can make her happy, get her out to Hawaii. Yeah. That's cool. Happy um, wife, happy life. Yes. And y'all been married for how long? We have been married since 1995. That's, that's awesome. No, 1990. 1990s when we got married. I'm sorry. That's awesome. So was that? So 33 30, years? 33 think, years yeah. at this point? 32 years, yeah. That's great. But, but we've actually been together since 17. We we went on our first date when I was 16, but uh, we, we were still not exclusive until I was 17. Tell us, what's the secrets? What's your secrets to a long, happy marriage? Because I've seen you two around each other. Y'all obviously still like each other. Yes, we do. <laughs> and that's great. Um, number one, don't get married if there's still secrets. Interesting. It, it, okay. Okay. I had a friend. I had a friend in downstate Illinois. I'm going to leave his name out of this. Was just so so smitten with this girl. Dated her for two years. Had set the date, and then found out that she wanted to raise their kids Jewish, and he okay. was not Jewish. And he said, "No, Santa Claus comes to our house," and that was the end of it. Now, which one of them is right? Well, neither of them is right. It doesn't matter. You have to make sure there's no secrets left. You don't want to find out. Yeah, you don't want to find out at the last minute. Yeah, that's a um, big deal and something you need to resolve or find a different way. Because those 
those are pretty non-negotiable things. Yes. And like you said, the one isn't right, the other isn't right, but they might not be right for each other. You know, he he doesn't want to have kids, but she does, or whatever else. All of those things are absolute deal breakers. And if you decide you can get past and we'll work it out, no, it doesn't work out. It really just doesn't. And I, it's unfortunate to look at it from that aspect, but it's true. Now, I would, and parents are about to hate me, I would recommend that you live with your potential spouse for a while as well. Because there's no better people... way to find out all the secrets about each other than to share bills. I've um, heard a lot of people trot out the statistics that say that if you live with someone before you marry them, your chances of getting divorced are higher. But I mean, I've I've done this and I did get divorced once, but the second time we've been together for 13 years, married for six, going on seven of that and happy as could be. And we we're able to figure out a lot of things up front. By the time you were married and had no legal choice but to share bills, you already knew that you both wanted the bills to be for the same things. Yes. You yes. see? <laughs> yes. Um, Marcy and I lived together for 11 years, <laughs> but <laughs> her dad but was beginning sin. to say, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's to be time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, that kind of practical advice when it comes to relationships, that's good stuff. And you touched on a good one right there, several good ones. Well, and, uh, and other than that, just communication, the fights that my wife and I have had, and trust me, there's been a few rocks in the stream, but they're always communications related. I thought you said this. No. So you really don't believe this? No. Then why are we fighting? Okay, not not me. I'm not actually not actually fighting. You're just engaging in elder abuse now. You know. Anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, communication is critical. The other thing is, I I don't know how critical. What do I want to call that? Attractiveness is that you'll be just absolutely attracted to someone. You need to be attracted to someone. But beauty can fade with time, except that if you really care for somebody, it tends not to. For whatever reason, it, it, it's like fine wine. It ages with you, you know, so. And to add to that, take nothing away from that, from that, that's a great point, is that say you're a person who your greatest value is I want the hottest man or woman I can get. Say you get, say you succeed. Say you get that hottie. You get that early 90s Cindy Crawford. Um, <laughs> okay. The fact that you get that one, you're still going to notice there's other hot people out there. Yes. So and did you really select for the right thing? Yeah. Because you're still going to want the beauty that those others have. So you're right. It's important that that you like looking at the person you're with. But the more important part, at least in my opinion, sounds like yours. I, I occasionally get the person. I occasionally get chatted up at shows still by by women. Okay. Well, I mean, I have I seen it's you weird, in person. It's weird, but it's it's true. And it, my son was nearby one time, and he's like, "Dad, she was hitting on you." Yeah. Well, you can introduce me. I was like, "Well, son, I didn't even think in that direction. I'm sorry, but well, <laughs> why weren't you interested?" I said, "Hun, I got underwear older than her." <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I know that doesn't mean much to you at the tender age of 25." But believe me when I tell you, it, it makes a difference. I, I I really don't want to go back to women who don't know what they want from life. I don't. But, you know, I'm I'm, I'm here to back you up if you need. Yes, sir. I understand. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. By the way, it's I have a single son. Ladies, if you, he's employed, knows how to fix his own car. 6'2", he's a big boy. It's, you know. Anyway. He comes from good parents. I've met him. Alexis. You know, okay. <laughs> So did you think when you came into this interview with Chris Clark, the man who's connected to everybody, that you're also going to get solid relationship advice? Because I told you, the guy knows something about everything. And that was good advice. He's not steering you wrong. Last thing I want to uh, finish up on is personal interest of mine. I know you're obviously interested in it too. Movies. Sure. Sure. What's your favorite movie and why? Or you can do a top three if you have to. Oh, uh, you're going to be shocked. Best Best directed and shot movie of all time, 12 Monkeys. Terry Gilliam, great choice. It's different every time you watch it. It is, because isn't it? The attention to detail by their uh, continuity director, just exquisite. And I, I, I've seen that movie 12 times. I still notice little things. And it's like, oh, my God, that makes so much sense. 
when you're watching this movie. Uh, and I want to say that's um, Die Hard. Yeah. Oh, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis in the in the starring role. He's exceptional. The the slightly nuts son of the one guy, uh, Brad. And it's not Brad Pitt. It's um, he's incredible in that. They the casting was beautiful. Anyways, favorite movie of all time, Twelve Monkeys, just because of the way they did. It. I read the book. The book wasn't as good by far. The movie really? was. Yeah, the movie was much better done than the book was. So in this uh, interview, you've exposed one of the rare instances where the movie was better than the book. Yeah. But in yeah. the hands of Terry and, Gilliam, a director like him, it's possible. It uh, is possible. Second, second favorite movie, I'm, I'm a big Kubrick fan. So believe it or not, Clockwork Orange. Yep. And the reason I like it isn't so much because it's really sexy, okay, but because you find yourself at the end of this movie rooting for the rapist oh my god what is wrong with me then i'm like you know rooting for this horrible person but kubrick has that ability to do that he crafted a story he worked the audience's sympathies yes and he knew what he was doing he pushed just the right buttons at just the right times and that that is the sign of someone who i'm very glad became a director <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's been decades since i've seen clockwork orange i do have a, a hard copy of it because i do want to watch it again but just recently i finally watched for the first time his eyes wide shut i had no idea what to expect but boy howdy that like yeah. instantly went into one of my top five i loved what he did there it's actually a terrifying movie yes you watch, you watch the trailers and you think oh it's gonna be a sexy movie no it's not sexy so much as, as it is horrifying suspense yeah, yeah. And his ability to dangle the unknown just around the corner from you. Yep. And you're trying to find the answer the whole time. And the uncertainty is killing you. The suspense is killing you. And honestly, I think that was Tom Cruise's best performance I've, I've seen. It could, yeah, that could well yeah. be. Uh, third movie uh, and, and final, Saving Private Ryan. Really? No. Why that one? It's a good one. It's a, a lot of people would agree with you. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. I still get choked up thinking about uh, those guys hitting the beach and what they went through and why. And it's it's right there. These are not fake character hero types that don't have a dark side or don't say bad language once in a while or that always treat women with respect. These are regular everyday Joes, and they just you know. Shows the human it, side of things it is, and the real it is. cost of things. It, it it was funny. My wife was a Civil War ophile and saw glory and doesn't want to watch Civil War movies anymore. <laughs> She's like, oh, my God, that was brutal. And I said, yes, it was. Um, I understand. And, and yeah, all, all war is brutal. Uh, and that, I, that's a testament to the power of the movies that you just mentioned is that it took this fantasy somebody had in their head yes. and showed them reality and it resonated so deeply, they understand it, they they appreciated the movie, but they never want to go there again. If you ever run into somebody who has had the unfortunate consequence of events that they came home a little nuts, don't wonder why. <laughs> All you have to do is watch one of those. Don't wonder why they're a little they're a little bit not normal anymore. They've just seen a little too much, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I grew up a farm boy. I grew up with dead animals and occasionally dead people around. It's never pleasant, but it's weird. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. There's a smell. I have. Dead body. And all I have to do is catch a whiff of it, and every dead body I've ever seen will flash before my eyes. Honest to goodness. It's, it's that. And to think of those guys basically living in that day to day. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, it's not just rotting flesh. It's spilled entrails and vomit and it's it's horrible but you know i and so prop, props to our veterans but uh especially those who had to be under fire in that and i can't imagine it's better than it was it's got to be worse because the weapons of destruction are even more destructive than they were back then yeah yeah so. yeah that's a very emotional my big three <laughs> you did three well that's a, an emotional point to wrap it up on it's been quite a roller coaster this interview and i appreciate you taking the time to do it 
I found it fascinating. I hope our audience found it fascinating. Uh, and you know where I live in, in the event that uh, there's something we missed, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I am not moving again. This, this is the house I will die in. Yeah. Yeah. Moving uh, way too much work. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that sentiment. And with that, well, I appreciate your time. We'll talk again soon. Thanks, Sounds sir. Good. All righty. Bye-bye. Now, wasn't that interesting? I told you that would be interesting, didn't I? It was entertaining, wasn't it? Well, I mean, it had to be entertaining for you because Chris and I, we had such a great time in this conversation that it there was even more material that I cut out and there was a lot of things that he, he couldn't legally say on camera. At some point, he'll be able to legally share it with us, but it's not that day is not today. It was just a great experience for me. I hope it was a great experience for you. And we want you to join in this conversation. So if you've got thoughts, questions, comments, please drop them in the comments so we can know. We'll read those. And find us on social media and say hello. We'd love to meet you there too. And so I appreciate your time and that you spent it with us. And as we, dear, dear friends, are soon to part, I wish you nothing but the best. Thank <laughs> you.